Um, so we have a number of questions for you. Uh, we are all curious to know uh, <clears throat> a lot of insights from you. You are uh, a role model for uh, some of our students and some of our professionals as well. So um, what motivated you to explore uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and data mining back in the 1990s for your PhD? Well, actually, uh, I got interested in, um, in AI even before that, uh, in the 80s, when I was an undergrad student. And I, I majored in, um, in electrical and computer engineering. And this, like, maybe a year before I graduated, I just saw this book in a bookstore called Artificial Intelligence. And it was the first ever AI textbook. It was by Eleni Rich, and it was like this small you know, small format, 400 page book. And I was like very uh, intrigued by what, what artificial intelligence could possibly be, right? It sounded like a contradiction in terms. So, so I bought the book and I read it. And, and you know, it had, um, these were early days. I mean, AI was, was decades old by then, but the things were still in a very primitive state. It had chapters about various things like problem solving, knowledge representation. And then at the end, they had the chapter on machine learning. And that chapter on machine learning is, is the one that really caught my attention uh, for two reasons. And this, you know, directly led to, to me then, you know, wanting to do my PhD, not just in AI generally, but in machine learning specifically. I realized that if you could do machine learning well, uh, you could then do almost anything else. So machine learning was potentially an incredibly powerful technology. Right on a par with, we, we, you know, with, with who knows what. Right, machine learning at the time was a very minor, uh, neglected area of AI. Everything revolved around knowledge representation and reasoning and things like that. So nobody cared about machine learning. But I had this, you know, <laughs> view uh, that machine learning was going to take over the world one day, and then I wanted to be part of that. And you know, back then this sounded silly, but actually these days it doesn't sound so silly anymore. Uh, so I thought machine learning was really exciting because if you can learn, then, you know, whatever problem you have in whatever area, whether it's business or medicine or, or you name it, uh, if you got good learning algorithms and you got the data, then you can potentially solve the problem that way or solve it better than if you didn't have it. So I thought machine learning was going to take over the world one day. This, this was, you know, <laughs> maybe naive, but, but it kind of has been, been happening. The other side of that, however, was that uh, the state of the art in machine learning was so bad. It's like, you know, no offense to the people who had been working in the field until then, but, but what I saw in that chapter was, was, was almost a joke. Right? It's like it bore no resemblance to real learning. I, you know, I, I was also interested in things like psychology and whatnot. And in psychology, you learn a lot about, you know, developmental psychology, how children learn, how infants learn, how people learn. And, you know, there was just such a vast distance between how people learn and what computers could do, right? And now a lot of people, I think, would see this as discouraging. But if you're looking for a topic for your PhD, this is actually the perfect combination. It's something that is extremely, potentially extremely important, and yet at the same time, very immature. Right? Physics and biology are important, but they're very mature. If you want to do a PhD in physics or biology, you got to spend a long time just learning about all the great things that people did before. Was it machine learning? You know, what people have done before was almost insignificant. So you look at that combination of things and, you know, it just becomes a very um, seductive area to go into. And I didn't like decide there and then that I wanted to get a PhD, you know, in machine learning. But, I, you know, I was doing other things that I was, that I was interested in. But I just kept thinking more and more about problems in machine learning and in AI more generally that, that learning was involved in problems in representation and, and, and reasoning and whatnot and how learning you know, would interact with those two. And, you know, and at some point it just became you know, clear to me that what I had to do was just you know, get a PhD in that area. And then I did a bunch of research. I tried to see where you know, the best research was coming from. And, and then again, as it turns out at the time, there were very few people doing machine learning. And in fact, most of the top computer science departments in the US had zero people doing machine learning. I, I only found, I mean, I, I didn't even apply to most of them because they didn't have anything that I wanted. Uh, there were really only two places that I was able to find 
uh, and, and you know that existed actually that that had more than one or two machine learning faculty. That was Carnegie Mellon and UC Irvine, and those two I I, I certainly applied to, and, and you know, and I got into UC Irvine, and that's that's where I got my PhD. There was also UC, UC San Diego. These were the days of connectionism, and UC San Diego had you know a, a significant group in that specific area of neural networks. Uh, so that, you know, that was also an interesting one, which you could say was not exactly machine learning, but you know, it was very COGSI oriented, which I also like as, as, as uh, you know, where CMU and, and, um, and UC Irvine, there were a lot of connections between, uh, you know, um, uh, AI and psychology and whatnot, which, which I liked. So, so um, yeah. And then, you know, and I was very lucky because I joined UC Irvine in 1992 precisely at the time where the long boom in machine learning was beginning. I mean, I saw, I'd been watching this exponential grow for literally 30 years. And the thing about an exponential is that the people who are just learning about it think it just started. But the people, you know, who've seen it five years before, you know, think it's grown by 10. But the people who've seen it, you know, 10 years before, you, you know, you get the idea. So, uh, and, and, there were half a dozen machine learning or closely related faculty at UCI, which again was, you know, unheard of for the time, and all their students together, there was an enormous amount of machine learning expertise there. And there was this methodology, which more than anything else is what has made machine learning successful. It's this whole methodology of having, you know, real data from the one, of separating the data into training data and test data, and you can do whatever you want on the training data, but it doesn't mean anything until you do well on the test data and so on. And, and learning that methodology was the most important thing I learned in my PhD, because that methodology is extremely powerful. It's still the methodology that we're using today. And it's what's been responsible more than anything else for all the successes that we've had so far. It also has its limits. And, and you know, we need to go beyond it. But, but I was glad I learned that at the time that I did, because that was, you know, that was just perfect. Yeah, I do remember uh, the textbook, Elaine Rich's uh, Artificial Intelligence. Um, uh, but then, uh, like you said, uh, uh, expert systems and knowledge-based systems were quite popular then. And uh, um, uh, there was an expert system called ELISA, I believe, uh, which had an accuracy of like 97% or uh, something like that. Uh, it would diagnose blood cancers. Uh, in spite of that kind of success, uh, uh, why do you think there was this winter, this long drawn winter in artificial intelligence? Well, there were two reasons. As you say, right, and a lot of people don't know this, even prior to machine learning, uh, AI systems could already do medical diagnosis better than most doctors on most problems. And this was using expert systems where you would interview some experts and write down some rules and then the system would reason with those rules. And this actually you know, worked pretty well, you know, worked well enough to, to do a good job. And, and some of the reason those expert systems were not adopted were not technical, they were sociological and, and political. But I think that there were two main reasons why, and, and you know, there was this wave in the eighties of AI, people, people now either don't know this or they've forgotten, but in the eighties, AI was the next big thing. Right. Japan had like their fifth generation project and then Europe had the Esprit project to, to, to answer to that and, and AI was gonna take over and then it all just died, right? And then there was like this AI winter starting in, you know, like in, I forget what it was, but like in 1989 or something, each guy had, uh, I'm, I'm gonna guess, I don't remember exactly what maybe, but it had several thousand people, I say 6,000. So now ICML and, and, and NeurIPS have more than that, but this has only been in the last few years. So what, what happened, right? It was really two problems. It was the knowledge acquisition bottleneck uh, was, was one of the problems, right? Is that acquiring knowledge in, by interviewing experts is extremely slow and expensive. It takes expert time and it takes an expert to interview them and encode the knowledge and, and, and so on. And, and, and then the cost versus the benefit of acquiring a knowledge and you know, knowledge has a long tail. There's a few rules that maybe do a lot of work, but then you know, there's, there's an infinite number of rules that you need to know. And then at some point this just becomes impossible. So, so and, and then this kind of coupled with the second big problem, which was the brittleness problem. 
which was that these expert systems worked if you were precisely in their narrow region of expertise, even within you know, some, you know, the study of say lung cancer or something. It, it was, you know, if you hit the right things, it did very well, but if you moved even slightly away from that, it just crashed. So knowledge acquisition, the knowledge acquisition bottleneck and the brutalist problem were the two things that killed AI in the 1980s. But then of course, the answer to those, the answer to the knowledge acquisition bottleneck was machine learning, is you don't have to interview experts anymore. You can just extract the knowledge from data. And then, you know, data is growing exponentially. So the power of machine learning grows exponentially as well. And this is really the way that we've been writing for 30 years. And the brittleness problem was, was addressed with, um, with uncertain reasoning. Right? We know how to handle probably, you know, like they used to have like these confidence factors and these hacks to deal with uncertainties and contradictions and whatnot. But they never worked very well because they were very ad hoc. And people knew about probability, but they didn't know how to, how to reason efficiently uh, you know, when, when probability is involved. While reasoning, reasoning efficiently and correctly turns out to be very hard because in the worst case, probabilistic inference is intractable. There's nothing you can do about that. But then a lot of technology you know, was developed, you know, Bayesian networks and belief propagation and et cetera, et cetera. So machine learning addressed the, the knowledge acquisition bottleneck, uh, probabilistic reasoning addressed uh, the brilliance problem. And when you put those two things together with a lot of data and a lot of computing power, you have something you know, very, very powerful. And that's, that's what we're seeing in action today. Yeah, I think that, uh, that makes very good sense. Um, so one question from my student, actually, um, some of these questions are from my students, like I mentioned to you earlier. Um, so they're curious, um, how do you get ideas about new machine learning research? Oh, in many different ways. Uh, the most common way in which people get ideas is, and this I think is probably the typical way a student starts doing a PhD in machine learning. And it's got its pros and cons. It's, there's an interesting area, let's say object recognition, and you read the latest papers in that area, and then you re-implement what people did, you re-implement the state of the art, and in the process, you know, you get to understand what it is, and then you start seeing, you know, where does it not work, right? Where did it mess up? Why did it think this cat was a dog? And then you start thinking of ways to fix the problems. And then you try them and, you know, probably the first 10 things you try fail. And then you try one that works and that becomes your first paper. And then you just keep doing that. So there's nothing wrong with this. And, you know, it's, it's a perfectly good way to start. It's in many ways a very smooth one. The downside of this is that it leads almost by nature to very incremental research. Right? The big problem with the great majority of machine learning research or probably research in anything is that it's very incremental. So I actually, you know, with my students, I do not favor this approach because I think what you should do in your PhD or in anything is not just find something that interests you and then try to make some improvements, is think a little bit more about how you can have the biggest possible impact that you can, right? What is the hardest problem that you think you can solve that is, you know, that is very important, right? And this probably is less likely to lead to, to success in the short term. But if you stay with it in the longer run, this is actually how you make, you know, the big changes, right? But you've got to have a certain endurance because it takes longer to succeed. Now, I think, and, and, and where do you get ideas from that? Well, um, not as obvious, but there I think it's where it really pays to be the opposite of what a PhD is usually by the end, you, by, by the end of it is to be broad. You wanna know the history of the field. You wanna know related fields. I get a lot of ideas from psychology, from neuroscience, from evolutionary biology, from statistics, from optimization, from control systems, right? The more you know things from other fields, uh, the, and the more you can relate them to the problem that you're interested in, the more likely it is that you'll be may, able to make a connection between the two. Many, many big breakthroughs are actually just a connection that somebody made between two things. Oh, we can apply this technique to that problem. And then boom, it turns out to work great. Well, why were we able to do that? Because you knew not just your area, but these other areas. So I think being broad in that regard, and then talking with people, going to conferences, talking to researchers, uh, you know, trying to have a broad set of inputs and then always be trying to, you know, combine them and, 
and puzzle them out and piece them together, I think is, is, is a really good way to do this. Now, I think at the end of the day, the best thing to do, and this is what I try to do with my students, is to try to combine the best of both worlds, is to have a, long, a large, important, long-term problem that you're trying to solve that you know, extends out beyond your PhD, right? There's this saying that uh, you know, if you're working on something that can be solved in your lifetime, you're not being ambitious enough. So I think you know, AI addresses that. But at the same time, you want to think what your path to solving that problem is and decompose it into a bunch of steps. And the first step is something you can do in six months. And then what you do is you do that step. And this step is something that you can do in six months if all goes well and it'll lead to a paper, which is good because that'll give you some experience and some confidence and whatnot. But at the same time, it's not just another incremental piece of research. It's something that you know if you can do that and then, then, then do the next one, uh, you know, you can do something uh, with a lot of impact. So, um, you know, those, those are, I think are, are at least some ideas on, on, on how to pick problems. Yeah, so along the lines, there's another question. Uh, what gave you inspiration to author so many research papers? Well, each research paper had its own inspiration. Again, some of my research papers were one-offs. It was some problem that I thought was important and decided to work on. Um, some of my best, most influential papers were one-offs. And others were part of what I just described, larger research projects that actually involved a lot of things. So, you know, so to give some examples of each, um, you know, I, you know, I teach a graduate course on, 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 um, on machine learning. And in, I mean, in the beginning, this was more, you know, um, was not very formal and we had projects and I gave people a list of projects that were things that I thought were, were you know, potentially good problems to work on. And one of them was something uh, that I, you know, there was essentially no work on at the time. This was like early 2000s and it was adversarial learning. So I suggested a bunch of projects and the projects, you know, I usually order them like easiest to hardest. So, you know, people can choose, but there was a group of students who decided to work on adversarial classification, which I thought, which was, a, and the general idea was, a, you know, to do a combination of machine learning and game theory, where your move is a classifier and your opponent's move is a, is a way to distort the data to make your classifier fail. And this at the time was motivated by things like counterterrorism and, and fraud detection and whatnot. But, um, you know, but, uh, 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 you know, there were a few students that decided to pick this up. And then, you know, when the class ended, that was like, you know, this is amazing. They've made a lot of progress. There were, you know, there were, of course, a lot of things that still weren't there. But I'm like, you know, we should do, go the next step and finish a paper on this and, and you know, and submit it. And we did. We submitted to KDD. Uh, it was a very exciting paper at the time because people were like, wow, this could be a whole new area. And I got enormous interest from people in industry because they, they had adversarial problems all over the place, many of which I hadn't heard of. But, but in, and that was, the only research, that was the only paper to date that I've written about that. But in terms of the research world for the next 10 years, I didn't see anything much coming out on adversarial learning. And then of course, you know, and then this explosion happened where now everybody, you know, that now adversarial learning is this huge area, right? It started with people, you know, showing that you could, that, you know, deep networks are surprisingly easy to defeat by an adversary. Right? This was a paper, uh, the paper that started this was in iClear 2013, maybe 2014, where they observed this. And now, they, and, and, and now, by now there's thousands upon thousands of papers on this because it is a very important problem. And one, there's a lot of good research that you can do. So I think this is a good example of, you know, uh, something can become uh, important, but, you know, you need patience, right? It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily become important that very day. As an example of, 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 of a set of papers that was more part of a larger project, you know, Markov logic is, is I think, a good one, right? Markov logic was a solution that we came up with to the problem of combining logical AI and statistical AI. Because you need logic to deal with complexity and logic is good for dealing with complexity, but you need statistics, you need probability to deal with uncertainty. And, but the two are very hard to combine. So historically, these two were separate 
you know, fields within AI. And then what people did in practice that I found very frustrating is you'd start with logical AI, like, you know, expert systems, and then hack together something to deal with uncertainty, like these confidence factors that, you know, would often give absurd results and whatnot. Or as typically in machine learning, people would start with some statistical learning system and then try to hack some reasoning capabilities on it in a very, you know, messy, unsound way. And, you know, is, there had to be a better way. So we figured out a way to combine these two, and that's what Markov logic is. It's a very, you know, simple and nice way to combine logic and probability in terms of the representation language. It, what you do in Markov logic is you assign weights to logical formulas, and then the probability distribution is the exponentiated normalized some of the weights of the formulas that are satisfied. So, so you can think of the formulas as soft constraints. And the more of these constraints a state satisfies, the more probable it is. And as it turns out, this has all the traditional, um, you know, logical languages and statistical models as special cases. So the representation is incredibly simple and powerful. But then, you know, we spent, you know, 10 years and, you know, we're, some of this is still ongoing on coming up with good, efficient learning and inference algorithms for this. If you think about it, the inference problem in particular is, is bound to be very hard because logical inference is hard. So this probabilistic inferences are when you combine the two, this naively is, is never going to work. And that's, you know, what a lot of people thought at the time. And then all the usual learning problems apply, except in this now richer representation. So we and many others, right? So like, you know, many hundreds of people at different universities and, and, and you know, research labs and whatnot have worked on this. So, so you know, there was this, it was part of this whole area of statistical relational learning. But, you know, I haven't counted how many papers I've published or Markov logic, but um, it's, you know, in the many dozens at least. Yeah, thanks for that insight. And um, again, a general question from a student. Uh, how do you feel when people cite your papers? So do well, you look forward to it or? It's good when people cite my papers. I'm definitely happy and grateful. But I think the more important question is, as I alluded to earlier, you want, you know, what you want to do is not just do some research that you like. I mean, you should do research that you like, but that's a weak constraint. You should try to have as much impact as you can. So what should make you happy is when you have impact. And citations are one measure of impact. They're not the only one, and they, they, they're an indirect measure of impact, right? The biggest impact is, you know, honestly, what makes me happier is, or happiest is not when my paper is cited, it's when somebody from industry comes to me at, at a conference and says like, wow, you know, we've been using this thing, you know, at our company and it works really well. And, you know, we've built A, B and C on it. And, you know, and we're doing something better, you know, than we did before. Or, you know, like something that, that I often get, particularly in relation to Markov logic is, 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 you know, people from industry saying, you know, thank you for solving the hard problems so we don't have to. That's what our job as researchers is, right? Is you, you spend the time and you really dig into this in a way that an industry would be hard because the time horizon is shorter, but then you do something that, that you know, people in industry will pick up. Now, citations are, are also a measure of impact. And, and in, in the, in the, people look at citations so much because it's such an easy way to observe impact, right? But you have to remember that citations are not all created equal, right? Citations are like Google's PageRank, right? Uh, and, you know, the reason Google has PageRank is just the number of links that a page has incoming is an informative measure, but, but a link from a page that itself has many links coming in counts for more than one that has few, right? So I'd rather have 100 citations in really good venues that are very influential, both with other researchers and with industry, than, you know, than 500 in a conference where, you know, that nobody really pays attention to, right? So it's important to remember that not all citations are created equal. And also, you know, citations can be a noisy indicator, right? If there's an important problem and you solve it, period, you probably get fewer citations than if you don't, because then people just start using it, right? You know, in machine learning, as it happens, you will probably get a lot of citations because people in other fields, like say in biology or in physics or business or whatever, they, they will write papers that use your methods, right? And, and you can see the impact that way. But in many cases, when you solve a problem, then you know, people start using it. There's not a lot more research. So, so actually, you, 
you the way you know you, the, often the way you get the most citations is when you partly solve an important problem and then people build on your solution and write a lot of papers about it and of course those papers then cite yours so in some way perversely if you don't solve the problem completely you actually end up getting more citations than than if you do solve it completely right I, you know there's this saying that i like that says you should try to write either the first paper in the area or the best one or the last, right? So, you know, the paper that I mentioned on adversarial classification was an example of trying to write the first paper in an area to start a new research area. And, you know, some of the favorite papers that I've written were like that. Writing the best paper in, in, in an area in some ways is the most satisfying thing is like, this is already a big area where there's a lot of people working and then you make the big breakthrough that really, you know, when you look back, that's probably the, the most important thing that happened. But then, but, but then there's writing the last paper, right? The last paper is the one where, okay, now we're done. And the last paper perversely doesn't necessarily get a lot of citations, but in practice, it's the one that really matters because that's, you know, eventually all the others were there just to produce that last one. So yes, you know, citations are good, but you should take them with a grain of salt and realize that the, the bigger picture is impact of which citation is only one imperfect measure. Yeah, I agree. I kind of agree with that. Um, and uh, if you were to pick one specific research topic to work on in the field of machine learning and data mining, uh, what would you pick uh, and why? Uh, well, uh, this is not hypothetical. <laughs> there's the topics that I'm working on right now. And, you know, there's a number of them, all of which I'm excited about, or I wouldn't be doing them. Uh, but let me pick one that I think is, is a particularly exciting one. There's also some that is really starting to take off. And this is symmetry-based learning. This is using machine learning. This is using ideas from symmetry group theory in machine learning. And, and what does this mean? And, and yeah, you may have heard about this, you know, in, with somewhat different names, like, you know, geometric deep learning or equivariant learning or invariance and so on and so forth. So this, this can go by more than one name. But, but what, what is the idea and why is it important? The biggest limitation of machine learning today and therefore of AI is that learning algorithms ability to generalize is still very limited. A human being can generalize much farther, much more easily than, than a learning system can. So machine learning systems are much less brittle than the expert systems of the 80s, but they're still far more brittle than people are. And you know, this has been extensively documented by now. Why are they so brittle, right? I can, you know, I can recognize a cat if it looks pretty similar to a cat that was in my training data, but if it's you know, kind of somewhat different or is you know, moving its body in a different way and you know, cats are very flexible or the lighting is weird, then the, you know, the system fails, but the human has no problem. So the question is like, what is that humans do that allows them to generalize so well? And you know, even to generalize from one task to, to another. I learned to do one job and then I can do another, right? I learned physics and then I go to work on Wall Street on finance, which superficially, there are a lot of people like this, has nothing to do with physics, but somehow they've acquired skills that are transferable to a superficially completely different domain, right? And so this I think is really central to machine learning. And you know, just to give a concrete example, it has been, you know, well, you even know this, right? It's like, you can give a child one picture of a horse and then they'll recognize horses correctly for the rest of their life, right? This is called one-shot learning, right? Learning from one example. You know, today's models don't, can't do that. They just, you know, they don't know how to do anything from just one example. There is this area, you know, of one-shot learning and whatnot where people are trying to make progress. And, you know, and I, I'm all for it. And there's other related ideas that, you know, like transfer learning, which I've also worked on and, and you know, domain adaptation, you know, multitask learning, these are all related. But the idea, but these are more different ways to state the same problem. The question is, how do you solve it, right? What is it that today's learners are missing? And my feeling is that they are missing something very important. And this is where symmetry comes in, right? A symmetry is a transformation. So there's a so, so symmetry group theory is a very large area in mathematics. It's one of the most important areas of contemporary mathematics. And it's extremely important in physics. 
So it's been said by, you know, Nobel laureates that physics is the study of symmetry. What we think of as the laws of physics, today we understand as they're all symmetries. Energy conservation is a symmetry, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know, the standard model is basically a bunch of symmetries. What is a symmetry is a symmetry of an object is the transformation that leaves the object unchanged. So if you want to be more technical, the symmetry of a function is something that you apply to an input such that if you then apply the function to the result, you still get the same result. So for example, if I rotate a cube, the rotated cube is still a cube. If I see a horse in a picture translated, it's still a horse. And in fact, convnets are powerful because they incorporate translation invariants. They just incorporate that one. It's the simplest and most trivial of all symmetries is translation symmetry, right? And, even, and, and that is enough for polymers to be as amazing as they are. So, so let's, first of all, incorporate other symmetries that we know exist, like rotation symmetry, scaling symmetry, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, we and others have done that. We have this thing called deep symmetry networks, which are precisely the generalization of polymers to any affine transformations, not just translations. But then, and more importantly, and this is what I'm working on now, is you don't just want to encode symmetries into your model, you want to discover new symmetries. First of all, encoding symmetries buys you a massive reduction in the size of the data that you need to learn, right? The, the, re the reason the comment is powerful is that if I don't know about translation invariants and don't exploit it, then a horse on the left of the image is different from a horse on the right, right? And every possible location of the object in the image requires its own training data, right? So knowing about a symmetry group reduces your sample complexity by, by, the, by order of the size of the group, right? So even just that is already incredibly powerful, but you know, these, these things you know, have been known since at least the 80s. Now, I think the real interesting challenge is discovering symmetries. If I give you the complete set of symmetries of an object, that defines the object. So one way to discover what an object is, is to discover all its symmetries. And so this, and, and then you can generalize much, much farther because you go like, oh, I've never seen a horse in this pose with this lighting in this context, but I've seen this other thing that's like a horse in this context. And I've seen that other thing that's like a horse with that lighting. And then I can compose these things. That's the power of symmetries that you can compose them. I can compose a translation with a lighting change with you know, with, with a change of context, with, a, with, with who knows what, right? And so by composing these symmetries, I can generalize much, much farther than just by doing interpolation, which is what machine learning does today. And in particular, you know, what we're looking at in my group is uh, discovering the symmetries from video. Discovering symmetries from a data set of random images like Im ImageNet uh, is very hard. Right, because you're in a very high dimensional manifold and finding your way in that manifold is not easy. A video is actually a path through the manifold with very short steps, which is exactly what you need to discover symmetries. You know, both intuitively and for technical reasons, there's this notion of Lie algebra and, and, and so on, which you know, we needn't go into here, but successive frames of, you know, say me looking at a horse galloping I can match the horse in the two frames, even without knowing it's a horse, right? Just, you know, by the similarity of the pixels. And then I can look at how it changed from one frame to the next. And that is a microsymmetry, if you will. And then I can compose this. And, and then if I can, if I keep doing this, this can become very powerful indeed. So that's, you know, that's one, I think, very exciting direction that, that I'm working on right now. Yeah, thanks for the insight. Um, and um, so great minds think alike, right? So it is quite possible that some others can also come up with this kind of an idea. So how do you stay on top of the rapidly evolving cutting edge technologies and make sure that you are, uh, uh, your direction is unique and things like that? So, sorry, just to clarify, indeed, many, typically in, in science, many people will come up with the same idea at the same time because it's the natural next thing. And indeed, symmetry-based learning is something that is taking off. Uh, you know, I just counted in, in the, you know, in the, in the just accepted, uh, you know, New Europe's 21 proceedings, there's about 50 papers with the word equivariant in the title. And that is, you know, that is a lower bound on the number of papers related to symmetry-based learning. And, you know, there's a bunch of people like, uh, you know, uh, um, Max Swelling and, and Michael Bronstein, 
uh, and 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 uh, you know talk to I mean a whole bunch of people uh, who are working on this. And you know the, you know the, and some of these papers have won like best paper awards at the top conferences and 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 Michael gave a very good you know keynote at, at the latest iClear. So so symmetry based learning is certainly an area that by one name or another is is, is definitely exploding. Uh, I think the big difference is that most of what we've seen so far is exploiting known symmetries, which is a very good place to start. That's where we started as well. But I think what's really important is to go the next step of discovering symmetries from data and, 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 and then composing them. And we're starting to see some papers on this, but I think this is where you know, most of the action is going to be. Uh, on, on the question of um, um, you know, how do you keep up? Uh, well, it's not easy keeping up with machine learning these days. And when I started in machine learning, I used to just go through the proceedings of ICML and, and NIPS and other conferences and read the abstract of every single paper. And then, of course, read some, you know, make a note of the subset of the papers and, the, and, the, and then read some of them. Uh, I mean, these days, that's, that's impossible, right? There's, I don't know, tens of thousands of machine learning papers coming out every year. So it's actually hard to keep up. Uh, I still go through the proceedings of all these conferences and at least look at the titles. So, you know, having a good title is very important. Having a good abstract is very important. If someone can't tell from your abstract what the contribution is and why they should believe it, uh, you know, you've just lost them, right? So, um, uh, but that's kind of like the brute force way of keeping up, right? A less brute force way of keeping up is to have, uh, I mean, there's a number of them, but first of all, there are, there's usually sub communities that work on the problems that are of interest to you. And those are smaller, right? Those might be a few hundred or even just a few dozen people. And those you can be in closer contact with both, you know, through workshops and just by meeting with them at conferences and talking with them, corresponding with them. And then they will often tell you not just what they're doing, but what else they've seen that is relevant to you. So I think having a somewhat, you know, knowing what problems they're interested in and who are the key people working on them and talking to them is probably the single best way to keep up. And then there's also, you know, um, um, you know, you can train um, Twitter, for example, what, what, you know, what you're interested in. You know, and that doesn't happen overnight, but, but you know, these systems do have machine learning algorithms that are trying to understand you're interested in. And, and what I found is that, you know, Twitter by now is actually pretty useful. You know, it's like maybe one in 20 things are, are this, you know, relevant. But, you know, that's, if that one in 20 things is something that's really going to influence me, it's, it's well worth the cost. So you can... You know, ultimately, you need all these information, um, you know, referencing tools that, you know, some, many of them not coincidentally powered by machine learning to handle, you know, all the stuff that's coming out. And, you know, they're still far from perfect, but they're already at the point where, where they can be very useful. Yeah. And of course, there's also things like, you know, um, <laughs> that I should mention that, that a lot of people do, which is they just subscribe to archive. Uh, in machine learning or whatever, and every morning they look through the hundred papers that came out, and you know that's uh, that's time consuming, but and it's also a brute force approach, but but that also works. So it's I mean the, of course the thing about archive is that what gets published there is very unfiltered, right? So it may only seem that each day you're only spending you know twenty or thirty minutes on it, but that really adds up over time. But you know it is one algorithm, and there's various tools that people have written to try and. Uh, you know, process archive for you and whatnot. And I think those will get better. And, and you know, th those are also worth potentially worth using. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we have a few or a few more in the audience now. Uh, so I'll probably formally welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, IEEE Computer Society Silicon Valley chapter. Ours is the largest chapter in the Silicon Valley section of IEEE with over 4,000 subscribers in our mailing list. We have uh, 1,400 plus paid members and a strong following of over 12,300 on Twitter alone. Of course, that is nothing compared to the 44,100 plus followers that Professor Domingos has on Twitter. We are uh, uniquely positioned by virtue of uh, our location and uh, we're indeed fortunate to be able to invite renowned speakers like Professor Domingos to our chapter events. Most of you would have read his research, watched his videos, or followed him on social media. He was interviewed by Eric Smith, the then Google chairman, and gave talks on various prestigious forums 
videos of which are um, available on YouTube um, today. Um, to formally introduce Dr. Pedro Domingos, uh, he is a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Washington and the author of the Master Algorithm. He is a winner of the SIG KDD Innovation Award and the IJCAI John McCarthy Award, two of the highest honors in data science and artificial intelligence. He is too well known to be introduced any further, so let's move on with the session. The, uh, just a, a quick note, the links to the video and the slides will be posted on our website in about a week. Um, the event is being broadcasted live um, and the recording will also be available on uh, IEEE.TV as well for watching in future in addition to the YouTube channel uh, on which it is live. And for, the, for those who have joined uh, on Zoom or uh, on YouTube as well, um, you can post your questions in the chat window and I will relay them to uh, Professor Domingos so that he can answer uh, them. Uh, I'm also posting the link to the YouTube uh, live uh, video, uh, live uh, recording. Um, so if any of your friends want to watch, uh, they are more than welcome to join the live session on YouTube. So with that, um, we can continue with uh, the Q&A session. So the next question, uh, we actually have a question from uh, one of uh, the uh, uh, one of the interested uh, audience. I don't see him in the audience right now, but he sent the question in advance. Um, he is uh, Harsha. And uh, uh, he wanted to know, um, are GANs, like generate, uh, generative adversarial networks, fundamentally unstable in the sense employed in control systems engineering? So uh, Pedro, he wants to know your opinion if GAN, GANs are uh, fundamentally unstable. So just to be clear, when you say unstable, do you mean things like them being vulnerable to mode collapse? Is that what you're referring to? That's what it seems like because in, he's referring to control systems engineering. So the applications there, I think, deal with uh, perturbations and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, you know, before we go on, just to make sure, the screen that I'm seeing right now is just your title slide. Is that what everybody else is seeing? Oh yeah, that's right. I will, I will probably stop sharing because there's no point uh, in sharing just that title slide. Or I can quickly. Um, show this one, uh, the event that is ongoing right now. Um, so did you have anything else, uh, Pedro? Uh, you, you want me to stop the sharing or? Uh, no, I, I just want to make sure that people see us as opposed to just the slide, right? Because the, yeah. Yeah, you want to take advantage of the video uh, uh, format as opposed to just the uh, audio. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so yeah, I stopped sharing. So I think uh, now uh, people can see everyone. See okay, who is talking. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, to answer the question, um, I think that GANs are indeed prone to instability. Uh, you know, they are. It's well known that they're hard to train and that they easily go wrong. And there's this problem of mode collapse where they basically just start, you know, repeating some small set of say images that they were trained on as opposed to, to you know to generalizing as well as you'd like them to and, and you know there's a lot of work on trying to make them better but the thing to realize about this instability is that it's it's really inextricably tied to what is good about GANs right what's good about GANs and, and very smart and, and potentially you know very powerful is that unlike almost all of the rest of machine learning GANs are not just solving an optimization problem they're playing a game Right? There's two players. There's a maximizing player and there's a minimizing player. There's the discriminator and there's the generator. And, and as a result, they can potentially learn much better, much more than if they were just optimizing to a fixed target. Right? In evolutionary terms, you can think of this as coevolution. Right? When two species coevolve, they can go like you know, like the predator and the prey, or 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 you know, or the or the you know, the parasite and the host. They can evolve much farther than if they were just evolving to a fixed target, like, you know, being able to, you know, survive, you know, breathe oxygen when you come out of the water or, or something like that, right? 
So this is potentially very powerful, but of course now you have this game dynamics that is also much more complex and much more likely to go in unpredictable directions than if you're just solving any optimization problem, right? If you have a convex optimization problem, you know where you're gonna wind up. You're gonna wind up at the, at the global optimum, right? And if it's you know, non-convex, well, then you might not wind up at the global optimum, but you're still gonna wind up at an optimum. Once you have two players, you know, what, what the dynamics is going to be and where all this goes becomes a very interesting problem. So this, so this you know, two-player dynamics is both what makes GANs powerful, and, but also what makes them you know, often unstable. And, but I think you know, the instability is not a reason to give up. It's a reason to come up with better uh, ways to do this. You know, and I personally think GANs are just the beginning of something bigger, which is, and, and actually not the beginning, they're one, probably the most visible strand of this combination of machine learning and game theory, where I think you know, a lot of the action is gonna be in years to come, right? Machine learning systems do not exist uh, in their own world. In the beginning, I, we could get away with treating things like that, but every machine learning system exists in a world, except the ones that are just modeling purely physical processes, certainly all machine learning systems that have to do with modeling people, which is most of the important ones, they exist in a world of agents that respond to the model once it's learned. And so you can't just learn a model and assume that the reality isn't gonna change after that. And these days, actually, most learners exist in a world where there are other learners learning at the same time. Like if you think about a net network, right? Everybody's learning about everybody. Google's learning about the advertisers. The advertisers are learning about Google and the users. Google's learning about the users. The, the publishers are learning about all of those. The users should be learning about all of these as well. So there's this very interesting you know, dynamics and, and you can model it uh, using a combination of machine learning and game theory. So I think this notion of a game where the plays are learners has a very, very, uh, you know, very far to go, right? And you know, it's, it's harder than traditional machine learning, but I think it's potentially very important and, and it's definitely an exciting direction. And Harsha has another question as well. So he's asking, uh, in the recent Stanford HAI conference on fundamental, also called as transformer-based models, some experts like Professor Jay Malik objected that uh, the models are just rote learners and lack many intelligent behavioral aspects like grounding, contextual reasoning, etc. Do you agree? Uh, I agree with Jitendra uh, on one thing and, and disagree on another. So I, I so at that at that workshop, he came out very strongly against their calling it. You know, they so the folks at Stanford they have the center and they're starting this project on what they call foundational models, right? And what are they calling foundational models? It's these large language models like you know like BERT and and, and Elmo and and GPT three and whatnot. And, 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 I, I, and, and Jitendra is not the only one that objected to this. Um, you know, I think Chris Manning also did, and then, you know, Percy Liang who's leading that group defended it or that, that project. The, I think calling these, these models foundational is, is a terrible idea because <laughs> they're not foundational in any meaningful sense of the word, right? They, they're, they're large language models. They are powerful because, you know, of the contextual, uh, um, you know, embedding, number one, number two, using transformers to do it, and number three, by learning on vast amounts of data, right? Because the, the, the beauty of language modeling is that you're just trying to predict the next word or variations of that. So all the text in the world can be used. And at this point, they're pretty much using all the text in the world to do this. So you, you can learn a lot, right? That's, that, that's what's powerful about them. But they're not foundational in any meaningful sense of the world. In fact, they're actually very shallow. They're the opposite of a foundational model, right? There's no real foundation to what's going on there. It's mostly a bunch of hacks and engineering that work. At one point, maybe we'll know what the foundational models are, but those, those ain't it. So a lot of people who, particularly the ones who kind of like, you know, like to work on things that are better founded, uh, really took exception to calling these foundational models. And, and I, you know, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, having, you know, let's just call them large language models because that's what they are. Which is not to say that, you know, um, they are remarkably successful. Uh, and this gets to the part that I disagree with Jitendra on is that like, they are more than just rote learners, right? They actually do something very interesting, which is they can transfer very successfully and with remarkably few examples from the tasks that they were learned on, for example, uh, you know, language modeling, 
two uh, very different tasks, like for example, question and answer. And this is very exciting, right? Transfer learning is not a trivial thing to do. And it's, you know, we were just talking about this before, right? Human beings do that much better than machines do. And it's certainly a big part of, of, of why we're, you know, successful in, you know, on the planet. So these models certainly do a lot more than rote learning. So I think saying they just rote learners is, is also kind of like, it's misleading in the opposite direction. It's underselling them as being, you know, less powerful than they really are. Having said that, uh, they are still a far cry from having, you know, I mean, people are trying to acquire common sense via, you know, these large language models and they acquire some, but actually a lot less than they seem to. And so, you know, we want models that can read text and, or machine learning systems, I should say, or AI systems that can read text and understand it and then reason and answer questions and useful things. And we are still very far from that, definitely. But we're also, you know, much farther along the road than just, you know, memorizing things or just doing, you know, uh, pure interpolation. So, so I think, you know, we need to have an accurate view of what these models can and can't do. And, you know, they're not foundational models, but they're not just rote learners either. Yeah, and uh, the phrase contextual reasoning reminded me of uh, semantic web actually. So semantic web uh, has some kind of reasoning built in. So do you think uh, there is some something to take away from semantic web uh, into the machine learning uh, area, uh, which can uh, make this probably a little more better uh, in terms of uh, their intelligence uh, aspects? Definitely, yes. I think the semantic web and machine learning can both benefit from each other a lot. And in fact, it's by that you know, feedback loop that I think will make the most progress. And people do work on this a lot these days under the name of knowledge graphs, right? Knowledge graphs is really extracting knowledge, you know, sometimes from text, but sometimes from things like the semantic web and then expressing the results in a way that, again, it may not be, you know, semantic web languages like OWL and whatnot, but it's, it's equivalent. So the, the importance of, of the semantic web broadly construed is that you don't just want to learn from scratch, right? Most machine learning today happens from scratch. But if you start learning from scratch, you can only get so far. The more you know to start with, the more you're able to learn, right? This is what we observe in children and humans, and it's gonna be the same thing with artificial systems. So if instead of learning from scratch, I can start by learning from a semantic web knowledge base, fantastic. And in fact, I've worked a lot on that, you know, using Markov logic as, as the, as the representation language to both, you know, encode the knowledge that you start with and then the learning algorithms and then, and then you know, and the resulting knowledge and, and so on. And it really works. So being able to do this combination of, of knowledge and learning is very powerful. It, it requires, you know, it's something that we've made enormous progress on in the last 20 years, right? 20 years ago, people just didn't know how to do this, right? And there was this vision of the semantic web that you know Tim Berners Berners-Lee originally had. They're like very clean, but spanning the world. It's it, it that just doesn't work, right? You have all these problems with like incompatible ontologies, and and you have to be able to, you know, uh, merge them and reason across ontologies and have you know contributions from a very you know of highly variable quality that could be wrong or or or, or ambiguous or contradictory. So you, the semantic web cannot work without machine learning and some form of uncertain reasoning. I think people in the early days did not understand this. I think now for the most part they do, but we do have the machine learning and the uncertain reasoning you know, to do that, even at scale. So for example, we've developed something called tractable Markov logic that we've used to build a very large, you know, a, a massive probabilistic knowledge base where you do efficient you know, probabilistic relational reasoning at, 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 at interactive speeds. And we built it from some of these traditional, you know, resources like DBpedia and, and Mel and, 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 and whatnot. So, so, so we can do this. I think the learning can benefit from the semantic web to not start from scratch. And the semantic web can benefit from the learning to be able to handle noisy and, and contradictory and, and incomplete information. So yeah, I think this is an important direction of progress. So in that context, there's also this graph databases. There's a trend these days to convert triple stores into graph uh, databases. Uh, do you think that's a trend which can help uh, the machine learning engineers? Um, yes, of course. So um, a lot of these things at some level of abstraction are all the same, right? 
a triple store and, and a graph are, you know, you give me a graph, I'll give you the triple store. You give me a triple store and I'll give you the graph, right? So, you know, there's no difference between them at some level. In terms of what happens computationally, of course, what's efficient and whatnot could be very different, but conceptually, this is all the same, right? And, and, and by the way, these days there's a very, an area that has grown explosively in the last few years is graph neural networks. So this is like the neural network version or the deep learning version of these things. And then there's like message passing algorithms and learning these models and whatnot. Precisely because if you want to lift neural networks to do things like reasoning and common sense knowledge, not just you know things like perception, which is what in the, in the past they were mostly good at, you have to start incorporating these notions, right? Having said that, I think there's something very important that a lot of people forget these days, which is graphs and and in whatever form, and and you know graph neural networks, graph databases, all of these things, they are a very limited form of knowledge representation. Right, a graph or or, or 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 a triple store, right, which is the same thing. They're just binary relations. This is a very far cry from a real knowledge base. Right. In fact, what people these days call knowledge base is 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 really what in AI, you know, is not what people in AI traditionally call knowledge base. It's just a database. Right. We shouldn't confuse knowledge bases with databases. Databases are a bunch of facts, and all of these things actually do not yet have even the power of a relational database system because relational database system can have tuples of arbitrary, you know, arity, not just, you know, two, right? Not just binary tuples, which is what a lot of these triple stores and, and, and graph databases have. You can have any area and you can do arbitrary joins between them, which again, a lot of these systems don't allow, but we're still just talking databases. You really get into AI when you have knowledge bases the difference between a knowledge base and the database is that the knowledge base, in addition to raw facts, which is what these are, tuples of any arity, which in addition to raw facts actually have general rules, right? And then you use those general, and then you reason with those rules, apply to those facts and to the new ones that you get. That's when you really, that's when the real action begins. And if you look at this on the on the domain of like, you know, today's web and graph neural networks and whatnot, it's it's only starting to happen, right? There's various, you know, research groups, you know, starting to work on this, but that's where a lot still has to happen. And again, in my group, Markov logic is precisely a language for doing this, right? So, um, you know, I'm not just saying this is important. This, you know, this is what I've been working on for, you know, quite a quite a while now. Okay, we have a question on the chat window from Jay Sarkar. So he's asking, working in the industry where there is tremendous hype and very little deep understanding of the specifics, such as correlation is not causation, yet such managers controlling the funding of projects. How do you suggest might be the best ways to manage this sociological problem in data science? That is a great question. And I agree with you. There's a lot of hype. And in fact, I often have this experience talking with people in industry, all the way up to CEOs, right? Of, um, <laughs> you know, the higher up it gets, the more worrisome it is. There's people who just, you know, bought the hype and think AI is almost solved. And that ain't the case. There's also people who think AI is a bunch of hype and there's no real content. They think AI is basically just a marketing term because that's what they see, these people trying to sell things under the guise of AI. And they don't realize that AI is a scientific field that is like 70 years old. And there's like a lot of really deep, you know, scientific work and, and scientific questions there. So you, you got to either, you know, so I think to answer your question very directly, the first thing is you yourself have to make sure that you understand the reality as opposed to the hype. And this decoding is something that you have to do on a daily basis. It starts with understanding the basic AI and machine learning well enough. Right? And you can try to do it at, at a technical level by you know, reading the textbooks and you know, taking courses and whatnot. You can also take a shortcut, which is read the book like The Master Algorithm. And I wrote it for precisely this reason, is that people, for example, who are in, they're not machine learning experts, they want to apply it in some area you know, without getting into the, the innards, or the managers you know, that, that need to be involved with data science for whatever you know, domain they're in or that they are you know, uh, CEOs or presidents or people that have you know, decisions to make you know, for the public, right? You, um, you know, 
you want a level of understanding of machine learning that's not just what you see in the media because that's you know not going to get you very far and you don't have the patience or even necessarily the background to go read the textbook so you know you can read the book like the master algorithm and then and then and then the next step is you need to educate your managers about it very important thing educating your manager kills a lot of birds with one stone right it improves your quality of life because now you don't have you know now your manager and you are on the same page right it has made your manager a more effective manager, right? And then, you know, maybe the best part is that hopefully that manager will then spread this to the people that they manage and their own superiors and other people that they talk to, right? So educating your manager is like the really important thing to do. And you can educate them with some of the resources that I just talked about, like, you know, uh, you know give them the master algorithm to read. I, I wrote it with people like them in mind. And then just on a daily basis, right? You, you have to try to educate them about, you know, what's, you know, what to do and what not to do. You know, another research, which, you know, sorry to keep mentioning things that, that I produced myself, but, you know, I did that for a reason, is I wrote this, this uh, article for CACM some years ago uh, called, um, you know, A Few Useful Things to Know About Machine Learning, which may well be the most downloaded article in CACM history, because it's, it's been millions, you know, by now, which is, you know, just telling, you know, people, it's one article, it's not a book, doesn't take a long time to read, but it dispels some of the biggest myths and give some of the most important things that, you know, it's a dozen things, but, you know, people have to, if people understand those things well and take them to heart, they will already be immune to a lot of the hype and, and, and a lot of the confusion. Yeah, actually, uh, this discussion brings to my mind uh, one other question. So like, um, uh, be it monetary rewards or uh, uh, career growth or even opportunities, um, industry has been far more attracted to the talent, particularly in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So what are some of the reasons for leading researchers like you to stay in academia? Actually, uh, uh, I would disagree with the premise of your question. It isn't, so um, I know it's easy to get that impression because all you see in the media is about AI and industry. But the great majority of AI research you know, just count the authors on papers at the major conference is still in academia. So most, you know, AI research is in academia. Of course, most of the applications are in industry because, you know, that's, that's what industry does. But, but if you are an AI researcher, um, it depends on what you want to do, right? You, um, industry or academia may be more attractive depending on, for example, if you want to work on things with immediate, you know, visible impact, yeah, industry will give you a shorter path. Mm -hmm. Having said that, these days it's remarkable that in machine learning, unlike in, in most fields, you can actually do something as a research project that six months later is being deployed, right? I mean, like I know many cases like this, you know, it's, it's happened with some of my own research. People read it, they re-implement it, and, and, you know, and, and a few months later, it's actually in, in, in use and maybe a year or two later, it's in wide use, right? So you can, but having said that, if you want short-term impact, you know, industry is probably better. If you really want to work on the bigger, longer-term impact, on the foundations, as opposed to just the immediate applications, academia is still easily, you know, a better place to do this. In industry, no matter what the good intentions are of the people in the research labs and who manage them, that short-term pressure is always there, one way or another. And, and in, in academia, you know, there's also short-term pressure, so it's not like it's, it's perfect in that regard. But, it, but if, uh, so what, why am I in academia, right? Because at the end of the day, I think the bigger impact will be had from, you know, AI is having a lot of impact in the world today, but this is nothing to compare, compare to what it's going to do once we really know how to learn as well as people do and so on. So if you really care about the deeper problems and the longer-term impact, academia is a better place for you to be, right? So, and, and not surprisingly, people tend to sort themselves into one or the other, depending on their tastes and their preferences. And honestly, we need both. A healthy system is one where there's very good people in both academia and industry, and they talk to each other a lot. Having said that, I would say that what you're seeing today that is not ideal is that, you know, certainly in industry, the other aspect is that in industry you can get much bigger rewards than in academia, right? And, you know, and be more pampered and have more infrastructure and et cetera, et cetera, right? 
Although even there, you know, it's not, you know, you might think that some of these labs and companies are, are, are paradised from the outside, but the people on the inside will tell that that's the case. But having said that, you know, you can get more rewarded and have more immediate impact in industry. And so to paint with a broad brush, I would say that applied ML people have gravitated to industry, leaving, you know, in academia with, with, with a lack of the more experimental machine learning researchers. So, so academic machine learning today is perhaps excessively theoretical, not for any deep reason, but because you know, the people who should be doing the more experimental research have gone to industry. And the thing is that uh, you still need you know, the experimental research again to make the analogy with physics, right? Theoretical physicists by themselves don't do anything, right? They know that a theory doesn't mean anything until you know, experiments are validated. And also the experimental ones don't do anything without the theory because they realize that an experiment is there to validate a theory. So we need both of those in academia, not just more theoretically inclined people in academia, but unfortunately, because the applied ones have gone more to industry, things are a little out of balance right now. And you know, the, the larger reality is that there's a shortage of machine learning people everywhere. So, you know, it's a great tool to get into because you know it's it's it it's still got a lot of room to grow. Most of the things that machine learning could be applied to still haven't been. There's a lot of things in the labs that haven't been transferred to industry yet. And there's a lot of new ideas to be had yet. So, you know, I think whether you go into industry or academia, uh, you can't go wrong. But in terms of the research, right? Like, uh, I don't think any academic institution can compete with Google in terms of resources, right? Uh, the kind of funds or the resources, uh, computing resources. Well, actually, um, no, but, but two things. One is that it doesn't have to, right? And the other one is that the difference is much smaller than you might think. So why does it not have to, right? I think that people in academia, and unfortunately many people make this mistake, they make the mistake of doing research that could just as well be done at Google or Facebook or one of these places, right? And then why do it, right? They, they have the resources, they have the money, right? Uh, and then, you know, in the short term, you know, uh, uh, motivation to do it, right? But if you really want to, so if, if your research interest is, you know, scaling up backprop to bigger data sets and more GPUs, maybe you're better off doing it in industry. But if your research interest is to come up with a machine learning algorithm that will be much better than backprop, which is what we really need in the long run, right? Then, you know, you're probably better off doing it in academia. Because in industry, you will, you, will, you will always have this pressure, you know, explicit or implicit to do things in the way that they are being done with their infrastructure. So the infrastructure that you have in industry is actually a double-edged sword, right? It's like you're at Google and if what you do fits well with TensorFlow, life is good. If it doesn't fit well with TensorFlow, you're actually probably not better off in terms of resources and infrastructure than if you were in academia. Also in academia, you can get, I don't, I've never felt a shortage of GPUs. We got GPUs and we can rent them. And we you know there's very large, you know, public data sets. So, you know, I've never felt a shortage of computing power or data in academia. So this notion that in industry, you have a lot more resources than in academia, uh, it, it's true at some level, but, but it's, it's a little bit too coarse. But most importantly, you know, what you should do in academia is research that is best done in academia, which I would say in the long run is actually the most important research. Yeah, actually, SR seems to be agreeing with you on the chat window, he says, I agree. Acad academia has more freedom to work on a topic. Industry can throttle it by ineffective funding. Uh, by the way, SR has been instrumental in uh, uh, helping arrange this event. Uh, he was the one who invited uh, Professor Domingos uh, to our event. So we are really thankful to him and uh, ACM for uh, uh, making this possible. Thanks, SR. Thank you. And um, so I have a few more questions from uh, mostly my students. Um, um, so one question probably which will uh, resonate with many other students as well. Uh, so this student uh, is not very comfortable with math. So um, he or she was trying to wonder if, uh, um, will there be a point when math will no longer be needed for uh, machine learning. Like after training the machines for years and decades, 
Will there come a time when text or non-numerical data need not be converted to numbers for machines to understand? I believe the intention is to just do it with math and uh, can it become an engineering task like software engineering? I think that's the essence of the question. Yes, so I sympathize. First of all, there's a lot of machine learning that you can do today without knowing a lot of math. Right? Machine learning is not just deep learning. Right? You can do things like learn decision trees, learn sets of rules, uh, do nearest neighbor type of algorithms. There's a lot of things that you can do that do not involve very heavy math. Right? And for many problems, those things are better than, than deep networks. If you look at Kaggle competitions, uh, you know, the biggest winners are still things like boosted decision trees and random forests and whatnot. So don't let the math intimidate you. There's a lot of good you know, machine learning that can be done without a lot of math, right? Um, I mean, having said that, a problem with machine learning today is that to do machine learning really well, uh, you do need to know um, a lot of things, you know, including math. And it shouldn't have to be that way, right? You shouldn't need a PhD machine learning to apply machine learning. What you should have, and you know, we have that to some degree today, but still a far cry from what should happen is you should be able to use off the shelf algorithms to do some modeling problem without knowing much math. You know, we have an introductory data science course for students uh, at, at UW at my university that's for people who aren't even interested in going to computer science, right? They're just interested in, you know, biology or business or, or medicine or, or, or astronomy or whatever. And, you know, they're not going to go into the innards of the algorithms. They shouldn't need to. They just need to apply them as somewhat black boxes, somewhat because. They, they have, should have some understanding of what's going on in order to use the methods well, but they shouldn't have to understand the details of how things are being optimized and so on and so forth, right? Having said that, of course, the most powerful algorithms are the ones for which this is least the case. So to use the most powerful algorithms and to do the most powerful thing, which is at the end of the day, what you want to do in every domain, which is not use off the shelf algorithms, but develop your own for your application. These days, in order to do that, you still need a PhD in machine learning, or at least, you know, maybe a master's. But I think, you know, the time is coming where that will not be the case. And in fact, this has been a big driver of my work and a big motivation of Markov logic is to precisely allow people to do very powerful modeling without, you know, create their models, interact in a very rich way with, with, with the system without knowing any math. If you're a psychologist and you want to build models of some psychological, you know, problem, you shouldn't need to know about, you know, optimization and probabilistic reasoning and all the stuff that goes on under the hood. You should be able to state, you know, the elements of your model in a modular way and refine them and take them back and, and see what the results are and whatnot. And this is precisely what we're trying to do with Markov logic and with, you know, open source implementations like Alchemy. There's still, and, you know, I, I would say, and I think that this is much better than what people do most of the time these days. It's still the case that at the end of the day for a lot of problems, you do have to, you know, you know, open up the hood and, and work on the engine somewhat. I mean, you know, and that's, 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 all, that's always true. But, you know, if you look at other fields like say linear algebra optimization, right? There are these packages that for the most part people can use, right? I can use an optimization package or a linear algebra package without knowing exactly how those, you know, linear equation systems are being solved. And I think the goal in machine learning should be to get to the point where the great majority of people using machine learning are using it like that. But you know, it's a, it's a work in progress. Also because you know, machine learning is powerful and you know, we keep getting more powerful things and you know, the powerful and the ease of use and the ease of use always trails behind. But I think the, the important thing for people like you to remember is you don't need to go straight for the most mathematically sophisticated, most advanced things. That's actually a mistake. Start with the simpler algorithms that are easier to use. And the chances are that those will get you 90% of the way. And then for the other 10%, if you still want or care about the 10%, then maybe you want to learn more sophisticated things. I think that was most assuring answer I've ever heard. But uh, then uh, um, AutoML is kind of uh, taking over that um, non-mathematics related engineering kind of work from machine learning engineers, right? So, well, what are it? It's, I'm glad you brought up AutoML, right? And, and AutoML, uh, under the name of meta learning, is actually a very old idea in machine learning, right? It, it comes and goes every decade or two, right? And, and what AutoML is doing in, you know, 
the big tech companies, for example, is that a data scientist is very expensive, right? And then what are what what do the, what does right you know <laughs> no one is more expensive than a good data scientist in industry these days uh, because you know it's such an important skill but it's still so in, in in such short supply right at least highly qualified data scientists and then they spend most of their time tweaking parameters you know and tweaking the architecture and doing this that and the other and yeah that could be done automatically so it should be right now you need enough data to do that automatically otherwise you overfit right. And previous generations of meta learning, the reason they they became popular for exactly the same reason. So around you know nineties in the nineties, meta learning was popular, but it didn't actually go very far because you overfit. Once you start doing meta learning, your risk of overfitting really goes up. So if you have very large data sets and you know the GPUs or TPUs or whatever, you know you can do a lot of meta learning, which is certainly you know a much better use. And then you free up your data scientists' time to do the real thing, right? But this is the thing to remember is that the real thing is not what RML is doing, is what it really takes, not just data scientists, but people with domain expertise, right? It's like, for example, if you're a psychologist or a, let's say you're a sociologist, right? And you want to build a model of some sociological process, right? The really important thing is combining your knowledge, your deep understanding of sociology or psychology or biology or whatever, Biology is actually, you know, maybe the best example because there's so much to know there, right? And so much still not known. But like the real work is combining your knowledge with the machine learning. And that <laughs> RML doesn't do that. RML just doesn't know any biology or, or psychology. So we do want RML to get that stuff off the hands of the data scientists and the people who are trying to do the modeling. We also want, you know, the data scientists to, to work with the people who know the domain. And then then we'll have better models that combine that knowledge with the data and, 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 in, and not just you know, in a one-shot way, but, but interactively. That's, I think, how we'll get to the really good models of things like models of how cells work, of regulatory networks, and, and therefore how to cure cancer and, and, and so on in, in, you know, in any domain that, 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 you, you know, that you're interested in. Sorry, I think it was my internet. Uh, sorry about that. You're able to hear me? Yeah, uh, we, we lost you for a second. I was actually looking in the, in the chat to see if there were questions I could answer in the meantime, but you're back, so let's keep going. Okay, actually there are some question on, questions on the YouTube uh, uh, live. So I'll probably relay those questions and some mm -hmm. comments. So I believe this is a comment from uh, somebody, Garib, I believe, uh, he says, uh, only a few large companies and top universities can afford to design, build, and train the giant transformer-based models, which I kind of tend to agree. Uh, but there's also a question from Claude Baudoin. Baudoin. Um, so the question is, so are the models becoming commodities? And the key focus of work for the rest of us should be on the data. Okay, so there's two related questions there. One, you know, the the, the first one is, uh, or you know, that was more in the guise of a statement, but I'll take it as a question. Like, only large companies and top universities can afford to train large transformer models. Well, yes and no, right? At some level, the the answer is yes. But remember, uh, Moore's law is still with us. The stuff that you know only a few blah blah can afford today in a few years, it's what everybody can afford, right? So that's coming, right? The models that you can learn today with you know with just a couple of GPUs, you know, would have boggled the mind of people 10 years ago. And the same thing will happen with these you know transformers and large language models and whatnot. Number one. Number two, increasingly the organizations, be the companies or universities that learn these models, will make them available for you for you then to do things on top of them. So that's good. They did the heavy lifting with the thousands or millions of GPUs, and now you can take advantage of the results. Okay, so but most importantly, right? Uh, 
what I would do if I was you, I mean, in fact, what, and what I do if I, what I do, right, you know, or at least one of the things that I do is like, don't try to learn the next, you know, billion parameter transformer model, no. Try to learn a model that has a fraction of those parameters and, and, and is vastly faster, but is as good. And then, and then you'll embarrass them. You go like, wow, this thing that you needed a billion, you know, uh, parameters for, and you know, and a billion, you know, GPU seconds or whatever, we can do just as well with a much smaller data set by learning better. So in a way, the sheer expense of those models is setting them up for someone with few resources to put them to shame. So do that. Yeah, you can do that with just the PC on your desktop. Yeah, I, um, so this again is a question from a student um, uh, who read your paper, but wants to know if there is an easier way to understand how gradient descent algorithm approximates to kernel machines. Okay, so just for context, for those people who don't have it. So I, I published a paper recently where I prove that um, every model learned by gradient descent, and in particular, every deep network is in fact a kernel machine, which is very surprising, right? Because the whole idea of deep learning is that it learns representations and doesn't need feature engineering anymore. The kernel machine just remembers the examples, memorizes them or a subset of them, the, the support vectors, and then compares them with a test example to make a prediction. As it turns out, you know, deep networks, which are supposed to be much more powerful than that, are really just a variation on that idea, right? They're still more powerful, a lot more powerful than a traditional kernel machine because the kernel is learned, right? But again, learning kernels is not a new idea. You know, new networks do it better in a number of ways, but as it turns out, it's much less surprising than, than, than you know, it's much, there's much less new and much less representation learning going on there than people thought. And now uh, the proof is actually very simple. You know, you can find the paper online and you know, it's like a 10 line proof. Uh, it's ridiculous almost. Uh, and um, you know, in that paper, there's a figure that I recommend, it's like figure one is a graphical illustration of what's going on. But just to answer your question about like, what is the intuitive way? So this sounds like a really surprising thing. Like how, how can that possibly be the case that a deep network is just a kernel machine? And, 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 you know, I guess you're asking if there's like a shortcut to understanding it. So let me try to give you, you know, the short, um, you know, not very technical version of this. So if, if a deep network is a kernel machine, what is the kernel that it's using, right? It's a kernel machine in, you know, standard form, right? Um, but what is the kernel that it's using, right? The kernel that it's using, is, first of all, there's an important concept that, you know, was proposed a few years ago that is, you know, um, very popular in the theoretical machine learning community right now, which is this notion of the neural tangent kernel. And you know, let's just call it tangent kernel because it doesn't have to be neural. The tangent kernel is just, um, so if you think of, the, of the, the gradient vector, right? The basic thing that drives backprop or gradient descent is the gradient vector, is the vector of partial derivatives of the objective function, the error function, with respect to each weight in the network, right? So if you have a million weights, this is a vector of a million elements, right? This gradient is what the learning is based on, right? If you have the gradient, you actually don't need the data anymore. Like the, uh, the rest is just optimization, right? And the neural tangent kernel is just the dot product, right? It's a similarity measure. And of course the quintessential similarity measure in kernel machines is the dot product, right? And so the kernel, the tangent kernel is just the dot product of the gradients, right? So, you know, I have the gradient at one point in instant space, the gradient, the, the, the gradient at one example and the gradient at another example, the dot product of the two is a measure of the similarity between the examples, okay? So this is the notion of the tangent kernel, right? It's really very much in the, you know, kernel machine spirit of, I go to a feature space and my, you know, dot products in that feature space are much more powerful similarity measures than things like Euclidean distance in the original space. The feature space here is the space of gradients, right? So that's the tangent kernel. What I do in my paper is I define a new type of kernel called the path kernel. The path kernel is just the integral, right? The tangent kernel is a differential calculus notion, right? 
And now what you do is you integrate that over the course of the learning. So if you look at the tangent kernel at two examples, x1 and x2, and, and you integrate that kernel over the course of the learning, that's the path kernel, okay? Because it's a kernel over the path taken by the waste during learning, okay? And what I prove in this paper is that a deep network is just a path kernel machine. The kernel that it's using is this path kernel, which is just the integral of the neural tangent kernel. And this is a very simple result, but it has a host of really, uh, you know, interesting and intriguing and, and potentially important consequences. So, you know, <clears throat> you know, read the paper if you're curious, but this is the basic idea. Yeah, I think it's a great work in terms of interpreting the deep learning models. And uh, along the lines of interpretability, there is this new concept <laughs> from MIT called uh, liquid uh, neural networks. Um, so I don't know if you got a chance to look at it, but uh, I was wondering what is your opinion about uh, this new concept of uh, liquid neural network? Uh, which uh, helps in interpretability of the models and also makes it more agile, I think, in the sense of uh, um, using, uh, I mean, in terms of active learning, I think it makes the model more agile. So uh, just wanted to know your opinion. Yeah, so I haven't looked at, at uh, liquid neural nets in detail, but if I recall correctly, they really, so there's this area these days where people are combining, uh, you know, deep networks with, uh, with differential equations, right? You have a differential equation that models the evolution of dynamic system, and you can enrich it with, with neural networks in, in one way or another. You can also look at ordinary neural networks as, as effectively approximating partial differential equations and whatnot. And this, I think, is generally an interesting area. Um, it hasn't, I don't think it has quite struck gold yet, uh, but I, you know, I haven't seen any you know, big impacts from this yet. But it's a very intriguing direction uh, where there's you know a lot of progress being made. So um, you know I think it's definitely something worth keeping an eye on. You know, liquid neural networks, as far as I can tell, are not that. You know, it's just a name that those folks at MIT found for their version of this. You know, um, people at some companies and some institutions like to coin their own terms for you know what in many ways are, are roughly the same ideas that other people have. So um, you know, I can't tell you anything about liquid, you know, uh, networks in detail, but, you know, in general, I think they're part of an interesting area. I don't think they're particular, I haven't seen any impact or applications or much follow-up uh, yet, but, but maybe there will be. Yeah, actually they are claiming that uh, this, will be, this is a breakthrough in uh, self-driving cars and stuff like that. And interestingly, it is based on um, the biology of a small worm. Um, it's called C. elegan or something like that. Um, so I also read in one of your articles or watched in one of your videos that you follow um, bio and neuro developments pretty closely. So uh, I was wondering what could be the next bio or neuro inspiration that could bring a breakthrough in uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence? Well, so I certainly take inspiration from you know, neuroscience and, and psychology and so on. I wouldn't say that I follow them closely because, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. Uh, but I do think there are a lot of ideas to be taken from there. And, 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 and they have been, right? A lot of the ideas in machine learning and AI come from, you know, I mean, neural networks being, of course, the most obvious example. They, they, they originated in, in biology and psychology and whatnot. And then, of course, you know, they've taken off in their own directions. But I, I, I certainly think a very good way to get ideas uh, is, is to, you know, to go look at these fields, because why wouldn't you, right? You know, think of this in engineering terms, right? Why not reverse engineer the competition when you're far behind them, right? We're trying to do the things that the human brain does, so well, let's open the hood and see if we can get some ideas from that, right? I think it would be, I mean, we wouldn't even be trying to do AI if it wasn't for the fact that we know it's possible because there is, uh, you know, a proof of concept, which is human intelligence. So, so definitely I'm in favor of doing that. Often different machine learning and AI researchers take inspiration from different fields. So one of the things that I talk about in the master algorithm is how the different paradigms of machine learning, like you know, one of course comes from neuroscience, there's one from evolutionary biology, there's another from psychology, there's one from statistics, there's you know, another one from more like logic and philosophy. So this is, you know, uh, you, can, you have your choice of fields to, um, to take inspiration from. Now to answer the question specifically, um, I think um, 
um, so, so I mean, we could talk, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that we could mention here, but, but let me just mention two. Um, one, if I had to pick a single area from which we can take the most inspiration, it's developmental psychology. I mean, I think people in machine learning should be paying far more attention to developmental psychology than they are. First of all, because that's where the miracle happens, right? You have a newborn infant. Two years later, this infant can do all sorts of things that completely baffle us in AI, right? What is going on there, right? Something amazing is going on there, right? So number one. Number two, developmental psychology has made tremendous progress in the last 20 years, right? They've developed this experimental paradigm where, for example, they, they videotape babies, right? The problem with babies is that you can't ask them what is it that you're doing, right? If babies could talk, you know, that would be amazing, but they can't, right? But you can, you can, you can observe what they're doing, right? And, you know, people in the world of mental psychology have learned all sorts of things that are A, surprising, and B, potentially very relevant to machine learning. But, for example, we, we you know, we humans learn to understand motion well before we learn to classify objects. In fact, our, our ability to classify objects is built on top of our ability to understand motion. So if you want to do object recognition, you should probably start with video. And again, this is something that you know, we've, we've, um, we've been working on in my group. As opposed to trying to learn, and I, I alluded to this apropos of symmetry-based learning, right? But there's, you know, that's only one aspect, right? Trying to learn objects from object recognition from ImageNet is actually a terrible idea compared to learning from a continuous stream of video, right? So, so I think, um, you know, there's, and this is just one example. So there's a lot that we can learn from developmental psychology in particular. Another one, of course, in neuroscience is, we, you know, we now have the ability to observe the brain at a, at a, at a fine-grained level that just wasn't there before. You know, there's things like the connectome, the various connectome projects, if you will, where we literally are, you know, building a map of the brain neuron by neuron. There's things like fMRI and, and so on that, that allow you to, you know, see what's happening in the brain, you know, almost in real time at this point. And with increasing resolution, not yet at the resolution of individual neurons, but, and we can apply, first of all, they need our help from machine learning to, you know, understand what's going on there. But, but the more we learn about how the brain works, the more we can use, um, you know, in, in, in machine learning. And, you know, just to give one, you know, example, of what I think is potentially an important idea is predictive coding, right? People in neuroscience are now at the point where they're starting to, you know, people have, so predicting, predictive coding is this idea that we, the basic way our brain works is by predicting the output and then looking at the error between your predictions and what actually happened and then trying to model that error with the next level. And then you look at the errors that you make there and go to another level, right? So this is the idea of predictive coding. And it's been speculated, you know, for, for decades that this is what the brain does. But we are actually now at the point where neuroscientists are starting to, you know, be able to go to specific, you know, to the cortex, to the cortical columns and say, look, this is where predictive coding is happening. And, you know, again, this is still, you know, despite being a decades old idea, we are only now starting to have the means to really suss this out. But, but, but as we do, right, I think this can directly inspire machine learning algorithms, potentially that will be much better than backprop. And, you know, you know, just to leave you with one thought in that regard, we all know that the neocortex, which is where your intelligence resides, does not learn by backprop. Your cerebellum maybe learns by backprop, but that just does, you know, low level motor control and things like that. So the, the, the real prize, which is the algorithm by which your cortex learns, is still out there. And maybe predictive coding is, is, is the path to that. Yeah. Uh, there is a comment on uh, the chat window from SR again. Uh, he says, Drishti.com seems to be doing a great work in learning from videos. So I think... Um, so uh, one other question, and I think you kind of uh, answered it uh, indirectly probably, but uh, uh, could there be a breakthrough beyond deep learning and more powerful, which does not use neural networks? Oh, definitely. In fact, I would say, you know, I would put my bets on, on that happening. Uh, and, and I think there's a couple of reasons to believe that. One is that if you just look at the history of machine learning, right? 
the basic ideas, the, the five main paradigms, they've been there since the 50s, right? It's amazing how old you know, these ideas are. But every decade, a different paradigm is on the ascendant, right? Deep learning is actually the third coming of neural networks. They had a heyday in the 60s, and then they died for 15 years. They had another heyday in the you know, late 80s, early 90s, and then they died for another 15 years or 20, and now they're having another one, right? But in between those, other fields, are, you know, like for example, in the 70s, the AI was dominated by symbolic methods. And, you know, the, the, in, in, you know, so, so, you know, NIPS, the main, you know, or one of the two main machine learning conferences started in the late 80s and it was called Neural Information Processing Systems. And the joke was that in the, in the, in the 90s, the name should have been changed to BIPS for Bayesian Information Processing Systems. And then in the 2000s to KIPS, for kernel information processing systems, right? And, and, and I remember, you know, joking, you know, to Yoshua Benjo around 2010, that the next decade would be the decade of DIPS, deep information processing systems. And, you know, and he, you know this, this seemed, you know, uh, unlikely to him at least. And, you know, he was working on it a lot more than I was. But if you think about it, like, you know, the decade of DIPS is now drawing to a close. So what's coming next, right? Pro there probably is something coming next. Right? So this is kind of like a very high level way to think about it, but more concretely, more importantly, uh, I'm really not convinced that backprop is the, you know, the master algorithm. Some, some people in you know, deep learning do believe that, but I can't imagine how that would be the case. Gradient descent, I mean, backprop is just gradient descent, right? With an efficient way to compute you know, the gradient, right? And gradient descent as a way to extract information from examples is extraordinarily inefficient. Notice there's two kinds of efficiency. One is computational efficiency and backprop is notoriously inefficient, right? Think of all the energy and cycles that the Googles and Facebooks of the world are burning, you know, right now, right? Both to learn and then to execute these networks, right? It's, it's not good, right? But even more importantly, data efficiency, right? Why do these networks need to see millions and millions of examples to learn things that you and I can learn by seeing half a dozen examples, right? Clearly there's something very important missing there. And again, to go back to my earlier point, we know that your brain doesn't learn by backprop. So we gotta figure out what that is or something else that's better than backprop. And you know, backprop will probably have its niche in the future, just like you know, previous algorithms do. But I would be very surprised if AI in the long term was dominated by backprop. So I would indeed, I think this is one of the biggest problems to work on is what is a better, you know, central learning algorithm than backprop. But it's definitely one of the main things that I'm working on. Yeah, actually, I had some questions on your master algorithm as well, some from my students as well. But we are kind of uh, uh, over the hour. Uh, is it okay if you go over a few more minutes? Or? Sure, that's fine. That's fine. Thanks. So, um, so one of my students is asking: um, Does the master algorithm shift back and forth between supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning methods in all potential mixes of analogy, imagery, connectionism, Bayesian, and advancement? Actually, it does more than that, right? So, the master algorithm is not just um, a, a, you know, a, 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 a function that calls these as subroutines as needed, because you know, we know how to do that today. It's actually something that explores the whole spectrum, right? It's actually not only just, you know, if you think, for example, of an anal anal analogical reasoning at one end and rule-based reasoning at the other, it doesn't just do one or the other of these. It can do anything in between. In fact, my PhD thesis was precisely about how to do that. You can have examples that are progressively generalized to being broader and broader examples all the way to very abstract rules. And again, same thing with supervision, right? The very salient question in AI these days is like, how much and what kind of supervision to have, right? And what we have in an implementation of Markov logic like alchemy is, is not, so it can definitely do pure supervised learning when you're given all the labels. It can also do pure unsupervised learning when you're given no labels, but it can also do anything in between. You can have labels for some examples, but not others. You can have, you can be indirectly learning from any information that is probabilistically associated with what you're interested in, either by knowing that from the data or by being told that that relation exists. So it can do, you know, any combination of these things and you don't know a priori what that combination is going to be while doing it all in the same consistent framework, right? It's not like it's doing 
either supervised or enforcement or semi-supervised learning, and it's doing either analogy or deep learning, like it's doing one thing of which these are all facets, right? You know, to give you an analogy, right? Um, think of Maxwell's equations, right? Maxwell's equations were not like, oh, you can do electricity or you can do magnetism, which in the beginning, that's what people thought. They thought they were different phenomena and you could have a theory of both of them. But Maxwell's equations went far beyond this. They actually showed that they were, electricity and magnetism are present at the same time. Each field generates the other. And moreover, the two together are light, right? So is light electricity or magnetism, right? The question you're asking me is like, well, is light electricity? You know, you have light. Is it electricity or magnetism? No, it's naturally both. And that's exactly what's amazing about it and where a lot of the new applications were. So I think it's the same thing with AI. Yeah. Uh, and uh, along the lines, has your level of optimism in finding the master algorithm changed since writing the book? Uh, that's that's uh, an interesting question. Uh, I was pretty optimistic when I wrote the book, as, as you can tell if you read the book. And I, I think, I mean, at this point, I could say that I'm more optimistic, but actually it goes beyond. I would say that at some level, and I will qualify that in just a second, we actually have the master algorithm at this point. We know at this point how to unify all the five major paradigms in a very tight and logically consistent way. So in some ways, now, of course, so what are the cats? So I'm more than optimistic. You know, I could say like, well, we've, we've succeeded, right? Now, I don't say that, and I don't think that's the case for two reasons. One is that it's one thing to unify the algorithms at an abstract level. It's another thing to have a unified algorithm that is efficient and effective in practice for a broad range of applications. And there, you know, we have made a lot of progress. So I am, you know, more optimistic now than I was back then, for sure. We have things like tractable Markov logic, for, you know, that, that is actually kind of like industrial strength Markov logic, but there's still a lot to be done there, right? But more importantly, uh, I, think, I think it's now becoming clear that even once, even after we have unified all these paradigms very, very well, we still haven't solved the machine learning problem and therefore not the AI problem, you know, that machine learning is essential to, right? My feeling, and you know, I can't prove this, but it's my strong feeling is that some of the most important ideas are not present in these paradigms. And, you know, we've mentioned a couple of them here, you know, like uh, symmetry-based learning, predictive coding, there, there's others, right? I think, and, and, and I think some of these are probably ideas that don't exist yet. So again, part of my motivation in writing the book was to, you know, get people outside the field who are not wedded to a paradigm to start thinking, you know, different ideas that maybe we, the experts, are too, you know, narrowly focused to have. Because I think at the end of the day, the true you know, a solution is going to be beyond a unification of these five paradigms. Maybe there's a sixth paradigm. Maybe there's, you know, who knows, right? Again, if you think of, you know, to take a more recent analogy with physics, right? The standard model, right, successfully unifies three of the forces, but there's one that it doesn't, right? So there's still that thing missing. But then, you know, there might be other forces that, you know, every now and then somebody thinks maybe they've seen signs of a fifth force, right? I think in, in machine learning, the evidence of the first force is very strong. So even after we've unified the ones that we know about, there's probably still more to do. Okay. Um, I'm not able to connect to YouTube, but thanks to SR, he's uh, saying that on YouTube, there's a question from Vikram Hegde. Um, power is nothing without control. What are your feelings on the lack of control in neural networks? Uh, well, I certainly agree with you that power is nothing without control. In fact, power without control is dangerous. Uh, the question of how you control machine learning systems and their results, and in particular, deep learning systems, is a very interesting one. Uh, but I would say that it's actually not as bad as most people think it is. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of talk about like, oh, you know, we lose control of AI systems and who knows what's going to happen. And, and I think a lot of this is a little overblown, right? And, 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 and the reason is actually very simple, is if you, if you get back to the basics, right? What we're doing in AI and in machine learning in particular is solving NP-complete problems. That's what it is, right? If the problem is not NP-complete, you don't need AI, right? Mm -hmm. But the characteristic of an, the defining characteristic of an NP-complete problem is that it's hard to solve, but it's easy to check the solution, right? So we can actually have 
control of a learning algorithm or an AI system that is incredibly powerful because it's doing the exponential work of solving the problem. We only have to do the polynomial work of checking the solution. So actually, and you know, this is a concept that at least to the lay person in the beginning is a little unintuitive. And sometimes the analogy that I use is like, if you're a manager and you have 20 people working for you, you can't do their work for them, right? Because then, you know, then what's the point? But you can check that they did their work properly to a large extent, not perfectly, right? And so we just have to be the managers of, the, of, the, of these learning systems, right? There's a lot, can be, a lot that can and will be done to make them more intelligible, more controllable, et cetera, et cetera. But fundamentally, I don't think it's the case that just because we have a very powerful and potentially you know, somewhat opaque learning system as deep learning systems are, but other machine learning systems are, that per se does not imply that the system will be very difficult to control. This is not to say that it's gonna be trivial to control, it isn't, but we have to see this in this context that controlling is much easier than actually doing the learning or doing the optimization. And another interesting question is, um, do you think in future, it is possible to implement machine learning algorithms without any actual data. So it is purely based on algorithm, no data. Is that kind of a, a machine learning uh, model, I mean, uh, way of thinking even uh, possible? Well, uh, I'm not sure what you have in mind there, but let me mention a couple of things. So there is this thing called zero-shot learning, which is learning from no examples, right? But what that zero shot learning is, is like you previously learned from a bunch of examples and now you're adapting it to a new domain just by giving you know, some, some heuristics in essence, right? So zero shot learning is possible, humans do it and, and, and we, are, you know, we have, are starting to have ways to do that in machine learning. But I wouldn't call that learning without data, it's just you know, you know, learning on one set of data and then transferring it to another, right? Now at some level, you know, if you're going to learn, you have to learn from something. So in that sense, you know, learning from data makes no sense. But I actually give you an example, which I think is potentially quite important and is very underexplored, which I think you could call learning without data, which is what actually scientists do a lot of the time, right? If you look at physicists, most theoretical physicists, they don't work with data, right? That's what the experimental physicists do, right? And then of course, when they make predictions, the experimentalists te you know, test them, but how do theorists do their work, right? And this, I think something that we could and should and will copy in machine learning is, the experimentalists generate a lot of data and then, and then the, the experimentalists or theorists or some you know, combination, they induce these so-called phenomenological laws, right? Which are laws that are just fits to the data. They describe what's going on, right? You know, a famous example is Kepler's laws, right? Tycho Brahe collected a ton of data on the motions of the planets. And then Kepler just came up with three laws about, you know, how the planets move, right? Very important laws, but this is actually the kind of thing that we can do with machine learning today, right? From the laws, you induce an equation, right? But that's not what Newton did. Newton didn't work with raw data. What he did was he came up with deeper laws that predicted the phenomenological laws. So a theoretical physicist typically is working with equations that already summarize a lot of data. So in your sense, you could say, you know, you know, he's not learning from data. He's learning from phenomenological equations. And maybe even better example is, you know, quantum mechanics, right? The single biggest problem that drove it was trying to explain the spectra of, 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 uh, of, of elements and in particular hydrogen, right? And there was something called Rydberg's law that, that already, you know, it was an empirical law that said, these are the frequencies at which atoms will emit light. And it was clearly something that needed to explain, but nobody knew how, right? And that, that you know, coming up with something like Rydberg's law, we can do with machine learning today like a million times more. But, but the, Niels Bohr's contribution was to come up with the theory of the atom, right? In terms of, you know, electrons going around the nucleus and whatnot that explained Rydberg's law. And then of course, Schrodinger's law explained even more and better and so on. But this type of doing machine learning by discovering on top of phenomenological laws is something that there's very little work on. In fact, almost none that I can think of, but as you can see, it's potentially very powerful. So, you know, you know we should do more of that. And it's also a problem that I'm very interested in. So Esar is saying, uh, isn't a phenomenon that's a prelude 
to a lot data in some sense. Um, but I think we are talking data in the sense that machine learning algorithms uh, work in a more inductive manner rather than on a, in a more deterministic manner. So in that sense, uh, probably uh, the data that, uh, okay, SR is clarifying that information is equal to data. So, um, so I mean, essentially everything has to do with information and uh, uh, something that has already been established. So that is, uh, that cannot be contradicted. But I think the question that I had in mind or, uh, was, um, whether we can do away with the, the way machine learning does uh, use data in an inductive manner. So I think that uh, probably uh, Pedro's answer uh, kind of uh, addresses that. No, but actually let me add something to that, which is, so the no free lunch theorem says that you cannot learn from only data. From, from data, all that you get is the data. Right? You need additional assumptions. But right. there's a mathematical theorem that says if all you have is data and don't make any assumptions, then you'll never do better than random guessing in data points that you haven't seen, right? You need additional knowledge to precisely induce, to generalize from the data that you've seen to the data that you haven't seen. Another question is how much knowledge and what kind? It's amazing that today's very knowledge poor learners like, you know, you know uh, can get so far. But first of all, they're more knowledge rich than you think, right? You know, deep learning, oh, you don't need feature engineering, but you need to spend the same amount of time doing architecture engineering. And that's where you put your knowledge into. And in fact, you know, in alchemy, you know, as I described in the master algorithm and as available, you know, in the open source package, alchemy is a Markov logic system that actually has two inputs. One input is the data, but the other input is your pre-existing knowledge base. And either of those could be empty. If you have no data, you can just reason based on the knowledge. And if you have no knowledge, you can just learn you know, from the data and you know, these generic you know, priors, if you will. But the really powerful thing is to have data and knowledge, right? And then you do a combination of inductive and deductive reasoning. Again, this I think is very important and people in machine learning often forget it, is that like, you can't just do induction, you can't just do deduction like people did in, in AI you know, in the eighties. You have to do a very deep combination of induction and deduction. And this is precisely what, you know, what we, we, we do with, with Markov logic. Yeah, and um, one of the, some other questions relate to the intersection of quantum computing and uh, machine learning. So uh, if you can throw some light on that aspect as well, that will be great. Well, so quantum computing, very exciting research area, but one that is still very unproven, right? There's a lot of theory about the algorithms that you could do exponentially faster uh, with a quantum computing, with a quantum computer, Quantum computers are not yet a reality, right? Maybe they will be, maybe they won't, right? And there's also many different ways to do quantum computing, and this is you know, relevant to machine learning, right? So it, it's hard to know at this point what the outcome will be of quantum computing, but let's just assume for the sake of argument that, that it will succeed, right? Then what will be its impact on machine learning, right? Uh, well, uh, I think the consensus among people that work on and there's a range of people who are more optimistic versus more skeptical. But I think even the optimists don't think that quantum computing will lead to general purpose computers that do everything better than classical computers. It will lead to computers that are exponentially better. That's the promise of quantum computing is to be exponentially better because of superposition on some problems, right? Another question is how does that bear you know, on machine learning? Well, actually, there's at least one type of quantum computing, which is actually not the most popular, but from a machine learning perspective, I think it's the most uh, interesting, which is, which is what is called adiabatic quantum computing, which is quantum computing, the problem that it's solving is optimization, right? It's not, it doesn't, this is like, you know, D-Wave is the famous example of this, right? There's this company that is, you know, one of the, was one of the first out of the gate with a working, or at least they claim working quantum computing, and, and it does this, right? And, 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 the, and the, the idea of, of adiabatic you know, computing and, and, and their machine is that it solves non-convex optimization. So the problem with non-convex optimization is there are many local optima that you get trapped in. And this is an important problem for machine learning and for AI, right? Like there's you know, a lot of our problems are optimization problems that are very non-convex, right? 
And the quantum computing idea there, which is a really uh, interesting one, is that you can use tunneling to jump from a local optimum to a less local optimum, a better one, all the way to the global optimum, right? You know, electrons don't get stuck in local optimum if they can tunnel, right? So potentially, this is the idea of adiabatic quantum computing is you can use tunneling to solve um, uh, non-convex problems in less than exponential time, right? So if you can do that, this will be brilliant use for machine learning, right? It remains to be seen whether you can do it or not, right? And it may also be that there's other kinds of quantum you know, computing that will turn out to have a bearing. Now, having said all that, there's another way in which machine learning could benefit from quantum computing, in fact, already is, um, is that in the process of trying to implement machine learning algorithms on quantum computers, people often come up with ideas that even if they never work on a quantum computer, they just worked on a simulation on a classical computer or whatever, they turn out to lead to good machine learning ideas. So to give you just one example of this, uh, there's a group at Google led by Hartmut Nevin that, that does quantum computing. And one of the first things they started to do was to um, you know, try to implement boosting on a quantum computer. And because they had so few bits, right? The problem with the quantum computer is that far, far fewer bits than classical computers, at least at this point. They, 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 they were doing, this was in simulation, they were doing boosting with very coarsely discretized weights, like really coarsely discretized weights, maybe like, you know, four bit weights, right? Uh, because, they, because they had to. But their big surprise was that um, when you did that, you actually got more accurate results than with the full length weights and didn't need to regularize. So, and I remember Hartmut like, you know, mentioning this to me and saying he was very puzzled. And I was like, well, of course, the, the weight quantization is doing the regularization. You're actually regularizing by having coarsely quantized weights, right? And, and, and so, so now you can actually, if you think about your typical regularization machine learning is, you know, is something like weight decay saying like, oh, weight should be close to zero, right? But this in most applications is completely bogus because we know the weights aren't close to zero. So there's not a very, you know, and, and the, really the idea of regularization is, is to just reduce the capacity of the learner. But why reduce it by making the weights go to zero? You can reduce it in a much more intelligent way, potentially just making them be coarse. So there's fewer possible weights, but they're actually located all over the map as opposed to near zero. So this is an example of potentially a good idea for machine learning that you could then go apply with no quantum computers at all, but that came from quantum computers. And, and, and historically, you know, a lot of good ideas in science and technology happen like this, right? The thing that motivated them you know, didn't pan out but then you wound up, you know, creating something that panned out, you know, for reasons that people didn't, you know, didn't expect. In fact, boosting itself is, is an example of that. So, you know, even if quantum computing doesn't succeed, maybe it will have some uh, positive impacts on machine learning. Yeah, and this question is from uh, Abhishek Bias. Uh, uh, he has a question uh, about uh, something that happened a few years ago after the Las Vegas shooting um, when a website 4chan was able to use Google top stories to boost fake news that the shooter was a different person. Google responded by saying freshness of news, increased queries to the different person's name, led this algorithm to boost the fake story. So it seems websites like Google weighed these factors over legitimacy of source. What should companies like Google do to stop boosting fake news. Is it time for their algorithms to have zero tolerance to fake news? Is such a system even possible? Is it their responsibility or should government step in? Well, this is a very important question, but in fact, I think the answer, the main answer to that question is, is neither of those, right? So fake news is a very hard problem, right? Google and Facebook and whatnot, they're doing their best. They have a lot of people working on this problem, but it's ultimately a somewhat insoluble problem because it's very hard to tell where fake news ends and real news begins. And in fact, different people will disagree on what is or isn't fake news or misinformation, right? So, you know, there's a lot of work that they can do, but, you know, but, but that's not gonna solve the problem by itself at the end of the day. Governments can also try to regulate, but they, that's going to solve the problem even less because, you know, what exactly, I mean, if somebody has a brilliant idea 
on how a government could legislate this. I'm all ears, but I haven't seen it yet. Like, how is the government, the government say, like, you should have to- zero tolerance for fake news. Well, what does that mean? Shut down the company, right? It's like, you can't, you can't have zero tolerance. For, you know, it's like, it's easy to say, but it's very hard to do. Now, does that mean this is a hopeless problem and we're stuck with fake news forever? Well, I mean, to some degree, there will always be noise and misinformation. But the big part of the answer, I think, is not the companies or the government. It's us, every one of us. We are all responsible for fighting fake news. Yes, it's easy to complain about the companies or offload it to the government, but it doesn't work that way. It's like each one of us, and you know, the companies can try to make the existing ones or new ones, right? They can try to make this easy for us, but like, I think all of us should be in the business of combating fake news. And then for example, what I do is like, because you know, the other thing is that like, it's extremely dangerous to erect either a company or a government as the arbiter of what is and isn't real, right? I mean, it's like, this is like a very dangerous path. Right? And then they have too much power and they inevitably start using it to serve their interests. And you know, look at what happens in China, right? The government controls them, that, that's not good, right? So what has to happen is that like, we need to all be in the business of deciding what is and isn't fake news. And then what happens is, for example, if I trust you and you see, for whatever reason, because I know you or because you know, in the past, you know, you've made decisions that I agreed with and you label something as fake news, I can say, well, I trust you and maybe a bunch of others like you that something is fake news and then I don't want to see it and vice versa. And moreover, I mean, you know, I actually had a paper with, 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 a, with a student and, and a colleague from IBM about this some years ago. There's this web of trust, right? I, I trust you, you trust something, somebody else and like, and we can propagate trust, right? If there's someone who just tagged something as fake news and I've never met them, but 20 people who might trust, trust that person, then I indirectly also trust them to some degree, right? So everybody being in the business of detecting fake news doesn't actually mean that everybody has to have a lot of work, but it does mean that at the end of the day, the amount of intelligence that goes into detecting fake news is much greater than any amount of intelligence, automated or human, right? The companies also employ a lot of people to do this that they could ever bring to bear. And it also means that you do not get a one size fits all solution, which is very important, right? Different networks of people will trust different other people in that network or outside, and, they, and then they will interact, right? But there won't be like one monolithic vision of what is real information and isn't, which no matter what it is, is, is dangerous. So I think, you know, the short answer to this is like, it's our job. It's not the government's job. It's not the company's job. It's yours and mine. So SR is asking, but aren't these companies or algorithms they use exasperate this issue? No, so they, so um, this actually gets back to this question of like, what are the companies optimizing, right? And the companies like, you know, social media, et cetera, et cetera, traditionally, or for the most part, what they do is they optimize engagement, right? And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, hysteria about optimizing engagement. And indeed, optimizing engagement is a problem, right? Because, for example, fake news, you know, tend to be, you know, people have studied this, right? They tend to be more engaging than real news because they're shocking, they make you angry, et cetera, et cetera, right? And if you're just trying to maximize engagement, then as a result, you're going to propagate fake news more than if you want, okay? So that, this is a valid point. But now let's think for just a moment about what engagement is and what maximizing engagement is and what we should be doing instead, right? So first of all, maximizing engagement per se, there's nothing wrong with that, right? And people are like, oh, the companies are greedy, they want to make more money, right? Well, notice two things. First of all, maximizing engagement is just a good heuristic for giving you what you're interested in, right? The companies too, it's not a zero sum game. They're trying to give you content that you will be interested in and they're judging it from your reaction. If you spend 20 seconds looking at a video instead of five, that probably means you're more interested you know, you shouldn't blame them for taking a hint from that. Again, it comes down to you. You are displaying that interest. And moreover, maximizing engagement is what every successful product in every medium does. A good book maximizes engagement, and that's why there are books, novels, because we read them. 
sports maximize engagement because you get into the game and you know keep following right video games etc like you know tv maximizes engagement everybody's maximizing engagement so there's nothing wrong with maximizing engagement per se right it's it's how you know it's how everything you know in the information world works right now of course this is not the whole so but now there's a couple of things to remember one is that these companies' ability to model what really engages you or not is still very limited, right? So we are very afraid of the power of these companies, but actually the problem right now in some ways is that they're not powerful enough, right? They're very, you know, their machine learning algorithms for all the data that they have are still not very smart about really understanding what interests you and how best to serve you, right? So I think they should try to do that better and they are, right? That's one point, but now, so in a way, the hysteria is overblown because the companies are actually not as good at maximizing engagement as you think they are. They are they've, they've, they've just gotten to the point where they can actually compete with TV and sports for your time, right? And win in some cases. But, you know, from there to being able to manipulate you, et cetera, is a very long distance, okay? But now, the most important point is this. And it is an important point, and it's directly, you know, uh, you know to both of these questions. If all that you're doing is maximizing engagement, you can do a lot of collateral damage, right? You can do damage to society because you're maximizing engagement and in the process you're hurting other things, right? So at the end of the day, I don't think you can have, you know, these very powerful companies like Google and Facebook doing nothing but maximizing engagement, right? For that reason, right? Because there are other important things you know, or more important than maximizing engagement to you personally and to us as a society. So how do we do that? Should we pass, you know, draconian laws regulating what they can and can't show? I mean, that's not going to work, right? It's going to forbid things that shouldn't be, and it's going to allow things that, that shouldn't be allowed, right? I think, but, but again, now I think, and again, connecting to our earlier discussion of optimization and then NP complete problems and whatnot, there is a good response to this problem, which is to act on the objective function. The objective function needs to have, right now, basically the objective function is something that is set purely by the company to maximize its goals, which again, partly align with yours. It's not a zero sum game, but also don't completely align with yours. So they can have their terms, which could be maximizing engagement or click through rate or, or, or you know, return on investment or whatever. But then there also need to be terms in the objective function that are set by you, right? I want to say to you know, Twitter or Facebook, what it is that I want to maximize. And it's not the time that I spend on the platform, I can guarantee you that. And there need to be some societal terms that those are legislated, right? Or maybe there's government AIs that interact with these companies' AIs, right? And then we collectively need to make those decisions and different societies will make them differently, right? But at the end of the day, a good objective function has business terms, individual terms, and societal terms. And, and the system should make it easy for this to be inserted. And that is what is not happening right now. It's not happening right now because most people don't even know that there's such thing as an objective function that drives the system, right? Or, or what it means or what could be done and whatnot, right? You can apply machine learning to learning what the person's objective function is, you know, and this is, this is starting to be done. So I think, you know, a machine learning system, you know, one of these things that like, you know, someone like Facebook or, or Twitter runs, it's very complex, right? But there is one thing there that's actually not that complex and that's what everybody should know about. You know, it's like, think of this as a car, right? You don't need to understand how the engine works. The mechanical engineers and the, you know, the mechanics can understand how the engine works, right? That's like the optimization algorithm in our terms, right? Or, or, the, or the language in which things are, you know, represented, et cetera. But you need to know how to drive the car using the steering wheel and the pedals. That you do. Otherwise, you don't get to drive the car where you want it to go. Right? right now, it's more like a car shows up at your door and says, like, get in, I'm going to drive you where you want to go, because I can guess where you want to go. Well, you know, maybe yes, maybe not, right? We all need to know where the steering wheel and the pedals of machine learning algorithms are, and they are the objective function. So everybody, everybody needs to understand and, 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 you know, how to interact with the, with the algorithm, not just at the level of providing data, but at the level of setting and adjusting the objective function, and there should be easy ways for us to do that. And the legislatures, the regulators, the politicians should also understand that that is how you should regulate, you know, AI systems, not by making rigid rules about what they can and can't do.
Yeah, uh, SR has a comment. He says that uh, the incident may not even be of real interest to me, but bringing similar incidents into my field of vision can potentially change my thinking on that topic. I think that's the point well taken. There's another uh, question uh, from Tom Moran on the YouTube uh, live channel. He's asking, um, an artificial intelligence applies what it has been taught. If it's taught, for instance, that all black people look the same, that's what it will learn. Any comments on how to ensure good teaching? Well, the way you ensure good teaching is by having high quality data. Yeah. Right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little amused by like this, you know, there's a huge brouhaha these days about how the data that machine learning systems is biased and what you need to do to fix it and whatnot. And honestly, you know, what you hear in the media is one thing, what's really going on in the research literature is another. And then even when you look at that closely, most of the time, the problem is not that the data is biased or that the algorithm is biased, is that the data is poor quality and the algorithm is stupid, which are bad, but it's a different problem, right? So we all know, right, this is like basic statistics that, you know, you, to learn a good model, you need a representative unbiased sample of the population. If your data is bad, you know, there's actually ways in which your model can try to overcome some of the noise. Absolutely, right? That's important. But, you know, machine learning doesn't do miracles. So a basic tenet of every good data scientist is try to get the best data that you can, which includes it being representative of the population that you're trying to model, right? But this is nothing to do with, I mean, like, nothing to do with, like, bias in the sociological sense. This is just, you know, what you have to do to do good statistics and good data science and good machine learning, right? Now... What I see a lot of happening today that I actually find a little alarming is people saying, oh, the data is biased and therefore I'm going to de-bias the data to make it better, right? There's a lot of you know, papers and even you know, systems you know, that, 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 that try to do this. And what this is basically saying is like, oh, it, 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 this is blaming the messenger, right? I think the goal of the machine learning should be to build the most faithful, accurate possible model of the real world as it is with all its words. Because we want to be in touch with the truth or as close to it as we can get. And then what we do with that truth is up to us. Again, we can decide what we want to optimize and different people will make different decisions. Do we want to maximize accuracy or fairness or accuracy and fairness or who knows what, right? But what you should not do is to start to distort the data to create a fake world that's more like what you think the world should be, right? This is like lying to yourself and to everybody else. Like there's this proposal to like, you know, sanitize the web to make it the way it should be. Like you're deciding what you think the web should look like for me. That's, you know, again, this, this, the, the, the potential for harm in this is, you know, is, is very large, right? You can create a world that really is 1984 and that someone actually gets to decide what reality is. So I think we should have a very important goal rule that's like, Machine learning is for learning the most accurate model that you can. And then what you do with that model is not for the data scientists or the engineers to decide. It's for the user, it's for the company, it's for the society to decide. We don't wanna be making for those decisions for them. So for example, a lot of this work on fairness in AI, just as like, you know, I, the engineer have this notion of what is fair. And, and I, I, I naively assume that that's the one universal notion and I have a system that, you know, is optimizing. And in fact, what it's doing is implementing my biases, you know, over yours, right? So our job as engineers is to make it easy for people to make the optimizations and the choices and the decisions that they want, that they find best. It's not to make those decisions on their behalf. And another interesting question, is there any area of human lives that cannot be affected by machine learning, given that machine learning is becoming more and more ubiquitous. I think this question makes a lot of sense. Honestly, I can't think of one, uh, but you know, if, if, if you have one, you know, if you have some candidates, I'm happy to look at them. The experience in machine learning so far has been of one area after another where you never thought machine learning would apply, turns out it does, right? I mean, to, to take some classic examples, right? Machine learning is better at wine tasting than the wine experts. Machine, you know, think of think of the money ball, you know, the whole money ball idea. Like who, you know, like who would have guessed that machine learning could basically do the job of, of a coach, right? 
and and you know better predict what are the players that need to be added to the team and whatnot. And I mean, he is maybe an even better example, right? You know, think of online dating, right? Online dating is, is actually extremely important, right? A third of marriages start on the internet, right? So, so there's children alive today that wouldn't have been born if the system had, if the machine learning algorithm hadn't recommended that those two people, you know, go on a date, right? So, but you know, I mean, what you have here is machine learning doing the job of the village matchmaker in the global village, or at least in the, in the city where, you know, those people are, right? Who would have thought that machine learning would ever be doing that job, right? That sounds like something that is quintessentially not something for machine learning to be involved in. Having said that, you know, machine learning is very good in sports and very good in wine tasting and whatnot. For, for dating, you know, is actually still, you know, pretty bad, but, you know, it could get better and it's an important problem. But, you know, uh, again, after you see all these examples of things that you never thought machine learning would be good for them, it turns out to be, you start to think, well, you know, uh, you know, the sky's the limit. I mean, we'll only find out by trying, but I actually think a good project for someone who doesn't even have to have, you know, you, you don't have to be a math head machine learning expert, just apply banal, ordinary, out of the box, you know, naive Bayes, logistic regression, your neighbor to some new problem, right? Some new area of human life or, or of business that people haven't applied it before. That, you know, could be a path to huge impact and huge success. So, you know, yeah, people should be doing that. If you think about the, you know, the, the um, I think it's the Bureau of Labor Statistics says the list, this list of all the occupations in America. And there's like, I think almost a hundred thousand different occupations, right? <laughs> Very different from 200 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. You know, web developer, right? That didn't exist, you know, 30 years ago, et cetera. I would, you know, I think a good exercise to do is to go through that list and see how you could automate every one of those jobs. And more than that, for each of those jobs, see what are the main subtasks of the job and see which subtasks you can automate because it's usually not the case that you can completely automate anybody's job, not even a truck driver or, a, you know, you name it, or a, or a bank teller even. But there are parts that you can automate and the real win is in automating those parts and then the people, you know, can focus on the parts of the job that really require human skills. So that I think is, is a very good exercise to do. And how soon do you think artificial general intelligence will become a reality? Nobody knows. That's the only honest answer to the question is nobody knows. Uh, you know, there have been these polls of experts where the median prediction is 50 years. 50 years also happens to be the earliest date by which most of us will be dead. So it's easy to predict that something will happen 50 years from now. I mean, there's optimists who say, you know, we're almost there, right? If you look at a lot of the people that work at places like OpenAI, right, they, they think, you know, uh, human level AI is just around the corner and that's why they're excited, you know, like one more tweak of backprop and more GPUs and then we'll be there. So that's, that's the optimistic end. There's also people who think, and, you know, they have, you know, valid arguments that it'll never happen because the problem is just too hard, right? There's this saying that if we were so simple that we could understand ourselves, we'd be so stupid that we couldn't, right? Now, of course, it's not just me trying to understand me. It's like an entire scientific community and trying to understand, you know, one in intelligence. So it's not that hard, but still, you know, like you can't prove that they're wrong a priori, right? And, and also, you know, scientific progress by its nature is very unpredictable. You make rapid progress for a while as we are now in machine learning and AI clearly, and then there's a plateau that could last years or decades or centuries. And then there's another period of rapid progress. And it really just depends on us. Now, I think we, and I, I mean, people often have a hard time getting their head around this. We've made an enormous amount of progress in AI, right? We've come, you know, a thousand miles, but there's a million miles more to go, right? The, the path to AI is very, very long. And most people don't even realize just how far from it we are. Having said that, we are making progress than ever before. And very importantly, there are orders of magnitude more people working on AI today than there were before, right? You know, there used to be, I don't know, a thousand researchers doing AI in the world, and now there's a hundred thousand or a million, right? So that, in it, that by itself should roughly, you know, ignoring certain factors, speed up progress by an order of magnitude or two, right? So, and, and also in AI in particular, we really don't know how hard the problem is. Now, the optimistic case, which is what I, you know, uh, make in the master algorithm is that 
there is one learning algorithm, which I do believe there is, that will be good for learning all the things that we need to learn. And that is the shortcut. If that algorithm does not exist, the path to AI will be very long and painful. If that algorithm exists, well, once somebody invents it, you know, it'll still take some decades for things to happen. So I don't think, you know, it's going to be less than decades, but it could be as little as decades. And ultimately, you know, you can't predict this because it depends on us, right? The, you know, instead of, you know, like, it's like Ellen Kay said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it, right? When will be the next breakthrough, you know? Well, you know, go make that breakthrough. Yeah. I actually wanted to ask uh, if, it, if you think it is even possible to generate a model of the world and predict how it is going to change uh, like in five years or 50 years from now, but I think I got my answer. So that would be a no, right? Well, um, I'm glad you asked it because certain facets of the world are inherently unpredictable, right? You know, one of the essential things about being a good data scientist or machine learning researcher is understanding that again, counter to what, you know, the hype and what some would believe is that machine learning is not magic and some things are just hard to predict, period, right? You don't have the data, or even if you have the data, there are problems where even if you have all the data, they're still hard to predict, okay? So certain things are inherently hard to predict, including many things involving humans. But at the same time, a lot of things are much easier to predict than you would think, including a lot of human behavior, right? I mean, a lot of what drives the application of machine learning today is that a lot of human behavior is far, you know, we're creatures of habits. So a lot of things are far more predictable than, than, than you think. So if you're in this, so the question is like, is there a model that will predict what happens in the world five or 10 years from now? I would say there is a model that will predict a lot of things correctly that will happen, you know, in the world five to 10 years from now, but not everything. But, you know, just predicting those things that you can will get you very, very far. So, you know, let's work on those. Yeah, along those lines. Um, so we all know the universal approximation theorem. Uh, so, Given that, one tends to think that we can get deep learning to achieve many more wonders than that are currently possible. There's no dearth of researchers or compute power. So then why is it that the progress is not as much as the promise? Well, because, uh, you know, the universe, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. So the universal approximation theorems, in a way, they're the foundation of machine learning, right? Uh, it, they basically say that in one form or another, if I have a sufficiently powerful learner, which could be from any one of these paradigms, in fact, there's a different theorem or more than one for each of them. If you give me enough data, I can learn any function. Okay. So this is very reassuring and it's very different from traditional statistics where you had some narrow class of models and that's all you can learn. Right. So being able to learn an arbitrary function given enough data is incredibly powerful. Right. But now, so those theorems are valid, right. And important but they're also misleading. Just because you can learn something in principle doesn't mean you will, given the amount of data and computing power that you have. And a lot of these universal approximation theorems, including for deep learning, right? I mean, I can learn actually, not even deep learning. I can learn any function using a neural network with just one hidden layer. So why didn't we solve the problem in the 80s? Well, because it takes a hidden layer with an exponential number of hidden units and an exponential data to go with it. So the question, right, is not whether that, you know, ideal of perfect approximation is there, it is there. The question is how close to reality can we bring it? And now there's a lot of work to do because again, at heart, we're solving an exponentially hard problem, right? And we need a lot of smarts and heuristics and intelligence and research to solve that problem, right? So, you know, deep learning has done great things, but, you know, it's just one set of techniques, right? It doesn't, it doesn't do magic. So the, there's a big gap between, you know, like there's this, you know, you know, Jerry Friedman, famous statistician, you know, who, you know, worked in machine learning, he talked about asymptopia, right? Asymptopia is when you have so much data that your, you know, your accuracy has asymptoted to the base rate, the best possible base rate. We don't live in asymptopia, right? And, you know, between your asymptopia, there's a very large distance in most cases, right? I mean, think of just, you know, classifying images, right? It's an, an image, one image is a million dimensional object, right? So just because those theorems are there doesn't mean that the road to them is, 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 is short, right? 
It also, by the way, means that it's not enough to say, oh, neural networks can learn anything, so I can ignore all the kinds of machine learning. A lot of people make this error with one paradigm or another, right? Well, the others have that too. So just because you can represent something with your language doesn't mean that your language is the best one to learn it. Re being able to represent and being able to learn different things, right? And at the end of the day, in order to be able to learn, it gets back to this you know, notion of knowledge-rich learning. The more knowledge you have, the better off you are. So, you know, so learning and knowledge are kind of like this, there's this feedback loop. You want more knowledge to do more learning and you want more learning to get more knowledge. And it's by, you know, it's through that feedback loop, I'm convinced that we will, you know, get to human level AI, not just one with one of these representations that we currently have. I had a question, question about um, learning from simulation. So, so I work in EDA and chip design tools. And one of the things there is I could apply AI if I can simulate the results fast enough for the AI to learn. And it seems like a lot of the tools that we have at the moment in chip design are just too slow for an AI to learn in any reasonable speed. Um, and I was wondering how does, does that apply in many other areas as well? So simulate learning based on simulations has a, a checkered history in AI, <laughs> right? Now there, there's, there's the promise and there's the pitfall, right? The promise of simulation learning is that you have infinite data. What could be better? Right? So in some areas like, you know, language, you have the web and you have a ton of data. But in other areas, like, for example, robotics being a silent example, right? Running, you know, robots takes a lot of time and is expensive. So you, you will never have as much data, right? So, but if you can do things in simulation, then, you know, the sky's the limit, right? You just need more GPUs and you can run more simulation. I think it's more like alpha, uh, the alpha go, alpha fold stuff or something where you, you can easily simulate a, a game of go very, very quickly. No, so, exactly. So the, and so the AI is, managed to learn how to play better than humans doing that. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So I was about to get to DeepMind because again, they're a very interesting mm. example of this, right? And precisely, they've been very smart at picking domains where things like this will work. By the way, game playing, they, you know, what made it possible was what's called self-play, right? It's actually not even simulation; it's just the computer playing against itself. This is one of the earliest ideas in all of AI. Arthur Samuel, you know, back in the 50s, created a program that played, you know, checkers as well as people by self-play, right? So DeepMind did not invent that. Some people think that was DeepMind's invention. It's like a really old idea. And it's a brilliant idea, but it works for those games, which, you know, the whole game itself is a simulated world. Now, in AI over the decades, you know, there were periods when people were just focusing on simulation, you know, on doing things in simulation for this reason. But the problem is that, and this is particularly true of machine learning, when you do things in a simulation, the, the learning has an amazing tendency to go cheat and pick out whatever in the simulation it can exploit to do well that has nothing to do with the real world. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's, get, a, that's kind of a fidelity of your simulation problem. Yeah. The problem with the simulation is that it's never quite faithful to the real world and moreover, your learner has an uncanny ability to find the places where they differ. So actually the modern, and then we'll get to the deep mind phase of things in just a second. The modern age of AI began when people said, no, in fact, there used to be an M for this which was micro worlds. We're going to do AI in micro worlds, right? And that basically comprehensively failed. You had some grand theory of AI, you tested it in your micro world and then we try to go to the real world, boom. It fell flat. <laughs> so the modern area of AI began when people said like, no, we're going to learn on real data sets from day one, and we're going to measure ourselves by how well we do on real data sets. Mm -hmm. This happened around 1990. And more than anything else, this idea and the methodology that goes to it, as I alluded to before, are what's responsible for our current success. Having said that, this methodology is running into its limits, partly because you mm -hmm. can't, you know, like at the end of the day, you have to learn from interaction. And you can't interact with the data set. If it's very large, you well, can't. You, but you can't interact with a simulator. And you know, one of the issues I have is that you're kind of bound by the compute performance to simulate things. And that might be what's holding some stuff up. Well, you, so you can make the simulator more and more faithful. And mm -hmm. indeed, you know, I, I, so I, part of how you can make the simulator more, for example, you have this in self driving cars. These days, you have simulations for self driving cars that are actually very, tight combination of imagery from real video of real cars on real streets 
but then the simulated generating, you know, moves by yeah. your car and the response that are different from what have happened before. And this actually is, is, is pretty good, right? It's better than a pure simulator and it's better than learning on static data, right? At the end of the day, I think learning in simulation is part of the solution, but not the whole solution. Well, I, th I think that's a, a particular case with the, the cars because we built a lot of special hardware for things like gaming. So, so we're reusing the gaming hardware for AI and, and it's good at those kind of things, like, you know, driving a tank around a battlefield, <laughs> you know? Uh, well, you know yeah. so, so the question is, you know, there's lots of fields for the simulation, but the simulation is too slow because we haven't built machines for that kind of simulation. Well, uh, paradoxically, right? I mean, I mean, look, at some level, there's no miracles, right? If your simulator is oversimplified, because it's yeah, yeah. Be fast, then you're only going to learn the simulator, right? But but even then, like you mm -hmm. can start by learning the, the the thing is like don't overfit to that simulator. At some point, it is like learning to drive, right? You can start by mm -hmm. learning in a simulator, and at some point, you have to go to the real streets. The better the simulator is, the longer you can learn in simulation before you learn yeah. to go to the real streets. But, but I, I was thinking like more of the Alpha Fold stuff, where something like Alpha Fold is doing chemistry, where it must have had good simulators for the chemistry in order to work that stuff out. <laughs> no, alpha fold is a great example. And in fact, I think the single thing that the deep mind guys are best at is speaking problems that you, that are yeah. important or catchy, but, but we can get there with our technology and, you know, and enough computing power. And the thing about alpha fold is actually, it's very interesting. So the domain of protein folding, right. Mm -hmm. Is so first of all, it's a, at some level, it's a very simple problem, but a very hard one, right? Mm -hmm. This is just figuring out how a single molecule is going to fold, right? It's orders of magnitude simpler than driving a car on the streets of a city. Yeah. But, right, it's a combinat, it's, as an optimization problem, it's a finishly hard one, right? So, so until alpha fold came along, and by the way, alpha fold is still drawing on this as well, right? Uh, the, the, the people tried all sorts of approaches. They, they, st they, they started with Schrodinger's equation that felt pretty quickly. <laughs> and then they had, you know, because of computational cost, right? And yeah. then they went to these like, you know, this one is a little more interesting. They had like these, you know, ball and spring models, right? Of molecules, right? Which are way faster than, than, than Schrodinger's equation, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem was that the error in these models was bigger than the gap between the local optimum and the global one. So, you, you mm -hmm. Like the you know, it just folded in the wrong configurations, right? The, yeah. the, the the optimization landscape for protein folding is 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 infernal, right? So finally, what worked, right? And in fact, the world expert on this is my colleague at UW, David Baker, and they have the system called Rosetta. Mm -hmm. And again, Rosetta is the perfect illustration of what I was just talking about. The way Rosetta works is that they have a bunch of of protein chunks that they know how they fold from crystallography data. Okay. But then, right, the thing is, that's not enough. You need to figure out how a new protein is going to fold. And then you don't do it using just optimization or just looking at your database. You do it by combinatorially arranging the pieces that you know. Mm -hmm. right? So there's a combination of simulated annealing slash gradient descent with instance-based learning to take the pieces that you know and combine them with the stuff that you know on each other in a way that minimizes the energy. Yeah. And this yeah. is what works best. So I was thinking of doing the same kind of thing with electronics. And it's actually an example of the same thing. Yeah. I, th I think the same thing can be done in electronics because, you know, a lot of electronics, it's the same basic components all the time, and <laughs> same basic circuits, you know, saying, okay, I'll just, I'll just give the tools a, you know, a list of things we know work and see if they can build stuff out of it. Exactly. And by the way, another thing that you can do, and people do a lot of that these days is, you can use, in fact, it's a very popular thing these days, is you can use machine learning to speed up the simulator. Yeah, yeah, I'm, right? I'm, planning, I'm planning on doing that. that way, and then you replace the simulator with the machine learned model. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, Bernard Widrow covered some of that in his stuff. And, you know, I've, I've been looking at it and like trying to sort of bring that into some of the, the analog simulator stuff that people do. Because yeah. if I can speed it up, then I can learn faster. <laughs> Well, again, the, the advantage is you can learn faster, but now you're only learning, you know, on your on your model of the simulator of the world. So you're getting farther and farther from the real world. So, you know, at some point, there's no choice but to go to model the model on world. a slow model. You know, it means I don't have to wait for the slow model. 
yes. So I, again, it can speed things up. Yeah. But but, it, but I, I can still work out that I got it wrong and backtrack because you know I can run both models and say, okay, tell me if I got it wrong, but assume that we're correct. And, no, but precisely. And in fact, I would say the major role of simulation is to cut out most of the search space of obvious bad things. Yeah. Right. Which saves you a ton of time. But then finally, you know, to really learn, you know, the correct thing or you know the best thing, you have to go the real world. There's one more twist on this that may be relevant to you, which is the following, right? And you know, an example of this was the open AI robot hand that learns to do, you know, Rubik's Cube, right? <laughs> and robots, so they're hard to simulate. We know that people in traditional robotics would spend weeks, actually, would they do spend weeks calibrating the robots, right? Once they get out of the box, right? Because the robot has all these parameters that you know differ mm -hmm. from the ideal, and but you, know, you have to work with them, right? What they did, right? And again, this idea was like from, from you know Peter Beale and, 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 and folks at Berkeley, but it's, it's actually it's a beautiful one. It's this: is that it only works for sufficiently simple systems. Is I don't know. And by the way, the way they did that is they trained it mostly in simulation, right? They had the simulation of the robot hand going on forever. Why did this work, right? Because they didn't know what the real parameters were, but they simulated a dense sample of the entire plausible space of possible parameters. Yeah. So somewhere in that space, as a near interpolation between points that they tried, is the real robot. And if you perform well over the entire space, you can perform well in reality. So these days we actually have enough computing power, enough GPUs, that yeah. if you're willing to spend the money, you can also use that as part of your solution. Yeah, which, which I think, you know, for me, a, a lot of the stuff that's slowing, slowing us down is just poor compute. <laughs> you know, uh, I think if we get better compute and if we can apply AI to building its own computers, then, you know, sort of we're bootstrapping into something quite new. <laughs> you know? NVIDIA agrees with you. I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with NVIDIA, though. It's like, no, but uh, they like, I mean, like what you just said is music to their ears, is my point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the problem they have is that... Um, Intel and NVIDIA just have a very hot and heavy way of doing processing. And, you know, I'm more of an analog guy and I'm, I'm like currently talking to like three companies that are doing analog based neural network type stuff, which is a lot lower power. And, and, and again, there's so yeah. much, I mean, as you know, probably better than me, there's a lot of innovation going on there and a lot of room to do things, right? You know, like NVIDIA is one company, the, you know, yeah. there's all this stuff on like neuromorphic computing and mixed mm -hmm. analog digital you know, processing and whatnot, and, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's been my space for many years is the mixed analog, mixed signal stuff. And, you know, if you if you know the math of how the things like spice simulators and stuff work, it kind of looks like neural networks. And you say, okay, my circuits that I'm trying to simulate look like neural networks. <laughs> You know, so I should be able to apply AI to this, you know, and, and you know, and then having built the machine, apply it to AI get and you know, circularly and yeah, yeah. Um, see where we get to. Um, uh, you know, it's it's you know, I'm trying to persuade some of my friends who work in silicon just to do adaptive filtering at the moment, <laughs> just to get some of the pieces done in analog. You know, yeah, so, sure. But, but I think I think you know, for me, one of the things is you know, time and distance is if if you can pack stuff into smaller spaces, you can if you can get enough compute into small enough space, you will get to that human level intelligence. Um, you know, and uh, it's it's basically about getting the power efficiency. Uh, up so that, uh, well, I mean, okay. it's more than that, right? Yeah. Even if we have perfect hardware, we would still need to know what to build with it. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, the, we, the we hardware evolved. is important, but like, <laughs> I mean, like, no, 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 no. AI is so hard that you could give yeah, me the size of the universe. And the evidence, the AI. evidence says, unless you believe in God, that we just evolved as we are, and um, a random process will get. Well, but again. We can take a lot of inspiration from evolution, but mm -hmm. my feeling is, and people have, right? There's this whole subfield of machine learning, you know, of genetic yeah. algorithms, right? But they're not the best ones for most, the, or for anything even right now. So my feeling is, mm -hmm. well, first of all, we don't fully understand how evolution, you know, and how the, how the cell works, um, right? I, but also, I, right, um, it's, it's like um, evolution is an extremely inefficient way to learn. You need a supercomputer mm -hmm. the size of the earth, and you know billions of creatures and billions of years not what we're it, it depends what you're focusing on because the thing about things that are like humans that are evolving is they have to survive they're evolving to survive rather than to be smart if all you're trying to do is involve a smart machine it's, it's, it's a different criteria <laughs> different goal um well smart encompasses a lot of things 
Yeah. And then if all you got to do is make it like, you know, pass a Turing test and be smarter than the average human, it's actually a fairly low bar, I think. But the Turing test is not the real test. Uh, no, but, you know, but, you know, for people doing like trying to replace humans in work, you know, it's like, it's probably not that, that, that hard. No, it is um, very hard. But I, <laughs> trust me. Some, it's hard when you haven't got the compute power, is my view. Um, no, I mean, like, I, I mean, look, well, go, you know, um, mm -hmm. right. At any point in time, we're doing the best we can with the compute power that we have, right? Yeah, yeah. It used to be the case that we couldn't match the human brain because we didn't have the compute power. But now, you know, you know depending mm -hmm. on how you account for things, we're at the point where we have compute power that is comparable to the human brain and still haven't solved the AI. So at the end of the day, software is going to be the bigger problem. You know, I mean, the way I see it is like, you know, what my brain does a lot of time is modeling things. You know, it's seen how things work. It's modeling them, you know, and, and for the AI to do the same stuff, it has to have that modeling capability. And at the moment, the only way we know to do it is these fairly slow simulators. So it's, it's a question of like building fast simulators that AI can rely on to tell it, you know, the balls are going to bounce. And... I mean, it is one approach to AI right now pursued by people like Josh Tenenbaum at MIT is to think of, you know, yes, our brain simulates the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can build a good simulator of the world, that is a big part of intelligence, but we actually don't know how to build as good a simulator of the world as, as our brain has. So there you go. Um, I, I, that seems like a doable thing to me. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at like, how do we simulate the entire power grid in the US for doing smart grid control with AI and optimizing things around global warming sort of energy savings. <laughs> you know? um, it's, it's, it's just much, a scale problem. It's much, it's much harder than it seems to be. This is um, the lesson in AI over and over again is that things seem easy, but then they're hard. In fact, understanding the visual world is, is, is vastly harder than you know, optimizing the power grid. I'm not minimizing the importance or difficulty of optimizing the power grid, but we're just talking about problems of a different order of magnitude. Um, so some of it's like, two, there's like one, 3D sort of modeling computing and the stuff I do in electronics is more like the 2D stuff. Um, and because it's 2D and you're building 2D machines, that's not too much of a problem. Um, the, the, the spatial stuff is 3D and then it, then it gets tricky. Um, and that, that's where I think you need to build machines which are sort of die stacks of processors and memory that can actually sort of have an intrinsically 3D thing like you have in your human brain probably. Um, you know, but then humans seem to be able to do four or five D things quite happily as well. So <laughs> you obviously don't need a a five D computer to do, talk about five D things. But uh, I'm not very good at it. Uh, I bailed out of physics. <laughs> Got too hard. I think it was that Schrodinger's wave equation again. Nice discussion. Um, so I think we have taken a lot of time of Professor Domingos than we asked initially. Uh, but I'd like to ask one last question, otherwise my students will be very disappointed with me. And that question is, uh, what are the tips that you can give to students who want to be successful in a machine learning career? Uh, well, um, in the industry or in research or both? Um, probably in the industry. Uh, um, you can comment on both actually, first starting with the industry and then uh, as a researcher. You know, we could have a whole you know, talk just about this, but, but here's, I think one, uh, very, so let, let me answer that question, you know, from the other end, which is when people try to, you know, have a career in machine learning in industry, what are the most common failure modes and how can you avoid them, right? The most common failure modes and something that I, you know, I'm always trying to, you know, train my students against, you know, including undergrad students, graduate, you know, the whole range is they learn one hammer and then they think everything is a nail, right? The art of data science is knowing what is the right tool for the right job. And then how to then, you know, so you start with the toolkit, right? You shouldn't have just a hammer. You shouldn't have just neural networks. You shouldn't have just decision trees. You shouldn't have to support vector machines. You should understand the full range and be able to use the right tool for the right job, right? This is step one. Already most people fail at this. The amount of money and time that has been, you know, 
I, I've met you know people like this often, right? Because they they have questions and 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 it's like they've wasted years trying to shoehorn their problem into the method A, when in fact method B already solves that problem. And they've been trying to kind of like slowly evolve from method A to method B. Whereas if they actually, if they knew a bit more broadly machine learning, they wouldn't have that problem. A lot of the fault for this lies with the teachers because you know, like they tend to just teach people their paradigm, right? And again, I really don't like that. And that's part of why I wrote the master algorithm. But in fact, this is only the first part. Ultimately, the best solution to any problem in industry is a, a, a learning algorithm that was designed for just that problem. And if you know this dependency between learning and knowledge, you wouldn't be surprised by that, right? Because whatever off-the-shelf tools you have, they're generic. And so ultimately, what you want is tools that incorporate more about your problem than those, than those generic ones. And then once you do it, often those, those new things in turn will become generic tools from some class of problem. Right. So, but you actually have, and this is actually interesting because there is no place, I think it's different from some other fields, where industry ends and research begins. At some point, even more for what you care about is a very specific applied problem, you are doing machine learning research in the sense that you are developing new learning algorithms. And this, I think, is, this is what makes the difference between the really good successful machine learning person, whether it's in industry or in academia, is that you know more than a list of algorithms. It's certainly much better to know a bunch of algorithms than just one, right? If you think deep learning is a solution to every problem, you are in square zero, right? But there's something much better than knowing the list of algorithms. It's knowing what the design space is and how to go where you want, right? Because there's new algorithms coming out every day, right? There's already 10,000 machine learning algorithms and a few more is there'll be 20. And no one can keep up with that. And moreover, most of them are completely irrelevant to you. So what you need to understand is like how to create your own new machine learning algorithm, not just how to use or even combine existing ones. And in order to do that, you need a deeper understanding of machine learning. And in fact, you know, that paper that I mentioned that I wrote, you know, in communications TM, a few useful things to know about machine learning. The first thing is what are the three basic components of, of a learning algorithm? It's the representation, the evaluation, and the optimization. And now each one of these has many options, and then you can combine them, right? But now instead of a combinatorial explosion, you just know, you know, there's like 20 of these, 20 of these, 20 of these, which all multiplied would be 20 cubed, right? So you need to understand what these dimensions are and how to fit, you know, your problem to the machine learning and the machine learning to the problem. That is the real art of machine learning. And ultimately, you know, so there's a lot that you can learn here and you need to learn this deeper understanding of machine learning. And ultimately it's an art, right? This is why the best machine learning people in industry get paid so much because there is no replacement for the, for the expertise that, that they've acquired. I mean, like everything, maybe they don't, not even they themselves are quite able to explain how they came up with solutions, but it's that ability to come up with new solutions that aren't just some existing off the shelf algorithm that ultimately distinguishes the best, you know, machine learning, uh, you know, people from from the rest. Yes, yeah. sir. As a comment, I think that relates to your previous answer. Uh, he says uh, from the he's quoting from the Upanishad, "Know that thing by which you know everything," and that thing is uh, self. He says, a "Good observation." Um, Actually, I have a few more questions, but I think uh, uh, we cannot <laughs> take more of your time. Probably uh, we'll call you back uh, next year if, you, if it is okay with you. Sure. Because I'm pretty sure a lot more people will benefit from your insights, valuable insights. Uh, as you have seen, there are a lot of questions. Uh, there's still a lot of discussion. I did not even check the YouTube uh, live. There must be a lot of discussion there going on as well. Uh, so probably if you can uh, come back again next year, that would be really great. Um, sure. Yeah, once again, thanks a lot for uh, coming and spending time with us uh, for the valuable insights. We really gained a lot of knowledge. And, thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and hopefully we'll talk to you again uh, sometime in future soon. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.